this time I'd like to call the meeting of the South County EMS Board of Oversight to in order. It's uh, 631. Take it away, Zoe. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, real quick, just at the top, uh, I legally changed my name from Zach to Zoe. So Z works, Zoe works. If you call me Zach, you go to jail now. That's my understanding. No, that's okay. Can I say hey? You hey. can say hey. Yo. You. Yo. Yo. Yeah. Uh, I'm still trying to get it right, so you have my permission to get or, it wrong if I... Hey, hey. Uh, hey, whoa. Hey, buddy. Um, great. Uh, so, top of the meeting, um, Diana, please pronounce your last name for me. Zinal. Zinal. Diana Zinal, Hatfield Select Board Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got you at the top of the agenda since um, you had requested through your town administrator to come up and just kind of ask what South County EMS was, how, how we operate. Um, uh, yeah, a little bit about that, and then, you know, we can sort of talk about some other reasons why I'm up here. Sure. But I am kind of curious about your the structure, how this works, um, just in 25 <coughs> words or less. Oh. <laughs> I like to hold court when I'm given the opportunity. Uh, so the three towns have signed an intermunicipal agreement, and that IMA outlines um, that the Board of Oversight will oversee South County EMS, and then the, how the three towns share in the cost. So the Board of Oversight kind of sets the strategic direction of the department, um, and then the uh, cost sharing is based on equalized value of um, taxable property and population. So it's kind of a complicated formula, but I've got it in the spreadsheet, uh, so if any questions come up. But basically, um, the larger your population is and the more taxable property you have in town, the larger your share, which because of the makes, makeup of the three towns is very similar, um, works out pretty close to also what the share of the calls are. So under the current model, Deerfield's share is 51%, and Deerfield accounts for about 50, 50% of all ambulance calls, so it just kind of works out that way. Um, and So you're Sunderland, Deerfield, and Waitley. And, 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 and I'm just going to add to that, yeah. the very cool thing, I'm biased, but the very cool thing that we worked out is that though the cost share is different, the governance is equal between the three towns. Okay. So it's two, two, and two with a third person being an ex officio out of Deerfield for, you know, more voice, what, what have you. But the equal representation means that we have to work together. It's not like a school district that right. one town can sort of ride herd gotcha. if they choose to. This is, it doesn't work unless we all work together. And that's the only thing I believe that keeps this thing going. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a great point. Um, and we are, um, we are technically a department of the town of Deerfield for financial bookkeeping reasons. All the employees are town of Deerfield employees, um, which is nice because we're municipal employees and you know we have to answer to the relative select boards and, and things like that. And uh, certainly when it comes to the emergency services, you're, and when I say emergency, so there is emergency medical response that uses an ambulance and then there is um, specialized medical transport, you know, for your dialysis runs and your nursing oh, home you trips. Do some of that? We don't. Okay. And, but the All point right. I wanted to make is they both use ambulances, so it's easy to confuse the two. We only do EMS right. okay. response. Okay. Um, and when you build an EMS department, um, you have to build it for what you can do, right? Um, and so, in order to be available for the three towns based on our call volume, we've set kind of a goal for. Um, what that coverage looks like, and then it's shared amongst the three towns. So each town, even Deerfield paying 51%, is still paying half of what it would cost them to do that themselves. So it's, um, and, and but that's part of that calculation when you talk about adding staff. You know, you can't, you can't add half an ambulance, you know, you kind of have to add a whole ambulance because you can't transport somebody with just one, you know, EMT or paramedic. And so that's where the calculations get a little funny is trying to figure out where those mm -hmm. lines intersect on a graph. So tell me about how, how many ambulances are you running and what are you running for shifts? Uh, we currently have 
our, our minimum staffing is one paramedic level truck 24 seven. Okay. Uh, and we staff that with full-time staff. We talked about the difficulty in trying to use per diems and stuff like that. We do augment uh, that one ambulance with per diem staff. So we add a little bit of staffing during the day, which is our busiest uh, times. Um, but all of those people are beholden to another full-time job someplace else. It's just like being a paralegal, right? right. You're gonna have a paralegal job. And if you decide to moonlight at another law firm, you know, if your regular job is going to pay you overtime, you're going to you're going to stick there or something like that. So, one ambulance 24/7 um, plus additional staffing during the day when we have it, and our <clears throat> shift coverage is similar to that of a fire department because that is who we are competing for in the job market is people who want to work in emergency services who want the benefits of a municipal public safety job. Um, but aren't interested in being firefighters. They want to just really focus on the medicine and be experts. So we have a rotating schedule. It's typically comprised of like a 16 hour overnight and a 24 hour shift somewhere um, else. And so that gives them nice respite time in between their shifts um, and then in between the weeks. So you might have five days off to be able to recover and, and you're not always at work doing this job. Um, and then part of that rotation, they rotate through kind of a more of an admin nine to five week. Um, and that's a lot of times when we catch up on our trainings and our, our meetings and our uh, continuous quality improvement. So we uh, this past year we did bring on two more full timers. So intrinsically that, that one ambulance is all full time staff. Um, we were having the same staffing issues it sounds like everybody else is having is that we were having A1 shifts that were uh, supposed to be filled with per diems and you just you can't find them and or you, you get a large fire in Northampton and they're being mandatorily held over to the next shift and now they're calling out of this because they can't you know and, and those types of compounding problems so when we started we anybody who was an EMT in the three communities was guaranteed a spot as a per diem and based on seniority you know they could pick shifts and do what they wanted and there was a big hubbub about making sure that happened and then the consultant we work with at the time told us that within two to three years you're going to see that list go from here to here and that's essentially what happened probably quicker than that who was your consultant ted baxter bruce baxter bruce baxter, bruce baxter. ted baxter was in mary tyler moore yeah <laughs> Just sort the of other Baxter. Bruce Baxter, he was out of Connecticut. Okay. Uh, we got a grant through FERCOG. I call him to hire Bruce, and he did a great job. We were working with MRI. Okay. okay. I'm not familiar with them. No. Um, I think, I, and I, I'm obviously biased in this, but I think really if you look at other, <clears throat> EMS is a relatively young profession. I mean, we're born out of the 70s. Um, and... If you look at fire and police and these well-established professions, you know they have full-time academies that are paid for by the state. EMS doesn't, we don't do that yet. They acknowledge that those are professionals that need to train all the time and that need to have um, security and uh, stabilization in their jobs, so you hire full-time staff. You know The city of Northampton, their fire department, that's all full-time firefighters. They don't try to do it with per diems. If you look at the Amherst Police Department, it's all full-time police officers. And so really, as EMS continues, even, what are we, 50, almost 60 years in, um, you know, really establishing that as a public safety agency, like, we, we're trying to do it on the cheap, but, like, those days are over. And out of all of the public safety professions, paramedicine is significantly the highest level trained um, and, and ex I mean, I think the, I think last time I ran the numbers, paramedics have four times the education as a full-time firefighter and two or three times that of a police officer, you know, and so professionalizing this um, and making sure that you have full-time staff that you can rely on and, uh, and, and that can grow with your department. So that's why, I mean, like I said, I'm biased, um, but regionalization kind of allows you to do that, right? So that economy of scale and saying like, Hey, this is something we need. How do we how do we share this cost? So, so what I would suggest is that you get a copy of the the report. We had the uh, for the Franklin Legal Council Government put it together for us. I, I would recommend you take get a, get a copy of that and look at what. The one thing I can tell you is every number, every 
every number that he wrote down in his report we've hit. And I, I just I just thought that was amazing. When when you look at the, and and he had done study because he, he runs or used to run the uh, the EMS for the state of Connecticut. And and I actually golfed with him up at Cherry Hill and I before he and we were just talking and and I said, geez, and then all of a sudden, next I know is he was the consultant at the Fur Cog at Hawk. And I go, wow, gee, I guess he really was. So you never know who you golf with. But I look, I would look at what um, he wrote in the report. I think it's a, a good um, base for starting at and understanding what what we we saw and what made us think that we could do this. He told us from the start what we were going to need. We pushed back because some things we just couldn't financially afford. And he sat across the table and he says, these are my recommendations. You can change any numbers you want. But I'm telling you based on my experience, this is what you're going to need to run this service effectively. You might not need it today, but you are going to need that. And within a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So that's that was part of why... Um, I suggested we hire the con a consultant. I'm not normally a consultant person, mm -hmm. and in Hatfield we have this kind of independent spirit where we like to do things on our own and uh, buy, make our own, you know. Oh, you never it, been make your own mistakes. mistakes. And, well, we never talk to we don't always make mistakes. No, I so you get it right. Yeah. But so, but but I think when I was thinking about this, and maybe I should backtrack to maybe explain why I'm here. Um, so we're you know looking at our response. Um, you know, it, it was brought to my attention by Northampton that they were coming into town a little more than was, you know, really comfortable for them. And so we've been looking at this over the last, really before the pandemic started and then the pandemic sort of changed everything, mm -hmm. right? Like we all know. Um, and we've, we've been able, we, we've funded at higher, much higher levels our ambulance staffing for the last couple of years, we've had the ability to use ARPA funding to do some of that and see if it was going to work with building these per diem shifts and in increasing the shifts we were actually staffing instead of relying on because we're still we're relying on call um, a lot and um, and we're you know we're still experiencing the same problem so it sort of led me as the chair of the select board to say what what are our options here Northampton has expressed interest in being our ambulance service. Um, Bob had said you had expressed some interest in, I don't know who he talked to up here, um, or or I shouldn't say he said you expressed interest. He had talked to you, and in any case, what I was asking was for two, was a proposal for if he wanted to come in and give us a proposal of what it would cost to have us be built into this program. Um, and I believe the way it was left was, well, couldn't really do it right now. Maybe you should go up and just talk to them about it. So that's why I'm here. I expect a proposal from Northampton. And then we'll have the consultant really take a look at everything, what our option is with Northampton, if there's an option to, to you know, look at this service, and then what, what it looks like if we do it in-house and what I'm wanting to explore is I don't think it's just a matter of saying okay well townspeople do you want to pay for these two extra shifts or three extra shifts a day to to staff this because I think that there's other components is our facility going to be adequate what does it do to our training budget what can Bob reasonably expect in terms of an increase in salary because he's got a completely different department that should that would be reasonable um, so just all of those extra <coughs> pieces of building our own department that I think we have to have a very clear picture of that and as myself as a select board member but also as a resident so that if when it comes down to a decision about what we're willing to fund we're making an informed decision. How many runs do you know? Yeah, how many runs do you know? I would say probably about 300. I don't know. I've got a list of over 50 questions that I would ask before I tried to uh, figure something out, but I crunched some numbers as well based on the, the calculation. I will say that, you know, when I was talking about how when you're talking about public safety, you're building capacity for what you can do. A lot of municipalities have 
added paramedics to their fire department because they see that they have capacity in that fire department. They say, well, we have people who, when there isn't a fire happening, what else can they do? Um, again, I'm biased. I think, you know, I talked about the training and stuff like that. You know, we don't ask our police officers to be experts in the law and also hazmat stuff. We identify those as separate disciplines. And so I think EMS really deserves to have a cadre of staff that are only focused on the medicine. Let the firefighters be experts in and hazardous materials and things like that. Um, and so whether or not that's combined with another department, you know, I think um, my only warning would be, you know, it's certainly an option, but be honest with yourself about, you know, if you're robbing one roster to help fund the other, then you'll be by definition short on both. Um, and so that's why I like South County so much because it kind of looks at it as just an EMS problem. Um, Bob did reach out to me and said, you know, that there, there are these questions. What is South County? What's your deal? Um, and I kind of gave him the, the same spiel that we've given you tonight. Um, there are a lot of questions about, like, right, like, e like even just oh, the, the most basic stuff of, like, how many calls a year. Um, very, 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 very back of the napkin math. Um, I figured that, and talking about response times and coverage areas and things like that, um, my gut tells me, and I've got how many years of experience on this? Um, you would need, to cover all four towns, you would want two ambulances 24-7. Right. Like full stop, and that that requires, because I like spreadsheets, that requires 19.24 FTEs. So you'd need 20 FTEs um, to cover that. Um, and, and four people on shift at a time. Four people on shift at a time. One ambulance would be in Hatfield, one would be in Deerfield. And... And depending on where the location of the call was, right, because they could also cover Wayne. Right, right, one hundred. Right? right. So, like, if it was South Coming Wayne, from or, yeah, right. exactly. Um, and and you would need that because the other thing that when when we regionalized, we were already kind of helping each other out, but you are taking mutual aid resources out of the equation as well. So your next closest truck is that much further away. So you really need to make sure that you are not just meeting your current demand, but also the demand of all of your towns, including the mutual aid responses. So those two trucks 24-7, um, ALS, uh, 20 FTE. Um, so, so and, and just, yeah. just to, to have a discussion, why would you have the other ambulance in Hadfield and not in Whiteley? But, or in, I guess, yeah, sure. I guess my point was, and one of the questions is, what are the geographic centers of your calls? Right. You know, like those types of things, right? You know, if maybe it is in Waitley because it makes more sense when we start GIS plotting, you know, these Which calls and things. Right. So that that's all part of right. that makeup mm -hmm. too. Um, but I think those two ambulances 24-7, you know, is a bare minimum. Um, Would you, is that, is that, I'm sorry. Zoe. Ah! <laughs> Would you need... On your slower times, would you still need that second, or could you do some calculus that would say, you know what, on a Sunday night, whatever your slower sure. are? Yeah. Um, I would say probably <clears throat> your your goal staffing would be four people, twenty four seven, and your minimum staffing would be two or three people. And so, you just define the parameters. Are you saying to include? A fourth community or are you saying that if you're operating your own thing you want this oh no this this would this be all four this would be that, yeah, this yes clarify yeah that um, 24 7 two ambulances is for four towns thank you for clarifying yeah. that yeah um uh, i think where hatfield is now is kind of right where deerfield was when deerfield was like oh we need to start putting you know full-time people on we need to start looking at this and so you're right on that cusp there i think you there is opportunity to get cute yeah. It's just the problem is that the law of averages. Right. I, I yeah. totally understand yeah. that. But people are going to start to ask in, in the three towns, Yeah. what's the added cost to us? Yeah. How are we going to be supplementing the town of Hatfield's costs? Of course. And, and again, I don't say that as someone who doesn't want to do this. I say that as you better be prepared for the conversations yeah. that are going to take place. And, and that's a good point. The intermunicipal agreement <clears throat> defines... South County as Deerfield, Sunland, and Waitley. And, and for that intermunicipal agreement to be modified to add another member town, the existing member towns must all approve. Right. That town. You know course. what I mean? So there, right. there are so many moving pieces. Right. And I think this, right, costs are going to go up. 
right? Because you're getting more service. So there's no way you're going to save money, even if you're Deerfield, right? Um, but you're getting more service too. So it's not like... Well, we're, what's the current staffing? I guess, well, I guess the current staffing right now is one, one ambulance 24-7. Right. Like that, that is like our With minimum impact, staffing. Sure. We have right. So, so right. So everybody's assessment would go up but everybody would everybody get access to a second, second ambulance 24 right. 7 and so that's all part of that calculus too. and it wouldn't go up double it would go up a fraction of that because of the we're on the cross <clears throat> of going to more like a, a longer impact shift right but not completely to I, that to second ambulance right. yet because our calls volume is like 1300 now or something right because you'd be eliminating yes. that impact shift and trading it for, for a some solar. A second one. Exactly. So it's not, it's not doubling that second show. Zoe has some information. I want to be very clear. This is not a proposal. Right. Okay. I understand. This is the calculation I made of two ambulances 24 7 with an estimated call volume um, based on what I was able to glean about Hatfield, um, based on current staffing costs based on an estimation of revenue that that's also part of the questions i don't know what your insurance you know breakdowns look like in hatfield but based on our own um and I guess they're pretty good yeah so basically you're looking at two million dollars worth of staff um another two hundred sixty thousand dollars for operating expenses plus your indirects um the indirect costs are what South County EMS pays back to the town of Deerfield for all of the front office stuff. The accounting, the clerk, the treasurer, the HR, all that stuff. Legal. Um, yep, legal. So basically, two ambulances 24-7 paramedic here mm -hmm. in this area runs you $2.3 million. Um, I would expect about $840,000 in revenue. That's based on South County's current numbers. Again, real spitballing, which leaves just shy of one and a half million to be assessed. And then you'll see the percentages down. That is based on the formula and the most current data. I think the last time population and equalized or taxable property was updated was like two or three years ago. So Deerfield's, that, that's the percentage breakdown. So Hatfield's share in the mix would be just over a quarter. Um, What's the percent increase over, over current? Per, per I think, region? I mean, you've got the, the, oh, the draft FY, yeah, I'm sorry. you've got the budget, you can see what the FY23 is there. Um, it's almost, it's all percentages of percentages. Yeah. So, um, I don't have the and That's fine. And then the other question that I would, that I would ask is, um, does the, Intercept, can the, could, is there a scenario where the intercept revenue would actually increase because our capacity is yes. so much larger? 100%. Um, certainly intercepts to Conway become like a standard thing that we could do because we have that extra capacity. We have another ambulance always available. Um, though the other neighbors would be Northampton. We wouldn't be intercepting Northampton. Of you know what I mean? We could be intercepting Greenfield, um, things like that. So. It does go up. Um, I don't know how much of an impact that would be. Because I don't see it here. So that's yeah, I mean, you know, if we're talking $300 in intercept times, I don't know, 30 a year, you no, know, so it's, not, so it's, it's insignificant, yeah. relatively speaking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, does this, I'm curious what this does. Does this raise Deerfield's numbers? Deerfield's in the yeah. current draft FY24 budget, Deerfield's assessment is 376,000, Sunderland's is 229, and Waitley is 122,000. So adding us makes this more expensive for all yeah. of you. Yeah. It's 30, by 30%? Yes. 35%. But you are getting twice the number of ambulances. You know what I mean? So that's all part of the, that calculus. But yes, it goes up. There's no way to save money. Um, there are... It, it, if there was a scenario in which you wouldn't need to add staffing, then adding a town would drop everybody's. But um, adding staffing. Yeah. Um, and then you do mention the capital, I, the ambulance itself. Yeah. So like, we have a pretty new ambulance that 
if, if we were to, pretty new. <laughs> um, I think it's only a few years old. So I, I think it's, it's eight about right. years old or seven years old no, or six years old. I think it's like two years old, yeah. maybe. Or so something two like that. is great. Yeah, that'd, that'd be our newest eight one. Seems you? like yeah. a relatively yeah. new ambulance, but you're yeah. closing in yeah. on when you need to replace it. Yeah, no, yeah. it's it's newer than that. Excellent. Yeah, but it, so I know that we would have to, if we were to think about this, and I don't even know how long a proposal like this would be to put together. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. um, I think you know we would be able to provide the ambulance at least so so your your capital replacement doesn't so, isn't built into your uh, budget. not in not in these calculations this is the cost to put the staff and the ambulances on the road anything capital would be above and beyond that okay. so what we what, what we did part of our agreement was that all three communities turned over their resources to South County so we all gave our ambulances and whatever all, all the equipment what right. equipment that that was part of the that was part of our buying part of our discussion though and I believe it was in the IMA any new towns that want to be admitted or join the group there would be some type of assessment that we'd agree on mutually as far as a cost a capital cost to come in and the ambulance would certainly play into that but if there's cost to upgrade the stretcher or a cardiac defib, you know, to get the truck up to the level or whatever we needed to do, there would be a discussion about that. So and, it, and so how do you work your ambulance purchase now? Typically what we would do is we would um, we would we so we would get basically revenue from billing above and beyond what we estimated. Um, and so that money would be put aside, and then every four or five years, we would have enough just to purchase the new ambulance. So we would purchase it out of retained earnings. Um, okay. the, the so there isn't an additional assessment to the communities on the years when you uh, Previously, the, the cost of an ambulance has increased by like almost 80% just in the past like two or three years. And so we find ourselves in this upcoming fiscal year in a position where we will have to assess a portion of it. You know, we have... A hundred thousand dollars to put towards the ambulance, and then the rest what would be assessed. What about leasing? Uh, uh, po possible, yeah. All those, those are all. Um, that was never anything that we did because we had the money on hand, and then right. we could purchase this, and then and we would trade it in for the next. We had two hundred fifty, you know. but we decided to upgrade that cardiac monitor um, three. Yeah, um, three. but so but we spent, just spend one hundred fifty. Any sort of capital assessment is also divvied up. By the same percentage. By the same percentage. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if I noted, mentioned this, but as an enterprise fund for South County EMS, all of our costs, including benefits, other post-employment uh, benefit costs, that's all accounted for in our budget. So, you know, Deerfield's share being 51%, that's 51% of the true cost. There's no, like, you know, health insurance is actually a different line item in the town or things like so that. like going to the schools to budgets. Yeah. This, is, this operates as, like, an enterprise fund. Yeah. Um, which is why sometimes for the uninitiated, our, our costs look elevated, you know, for like uh, personnel costs or like, how is somebody, how is an employee costing you, you know, 80 something thousand? It's like, well, no, their salaries are 63, but then the rest is all benefits. Right. It's true. Are. It's true fringe as yes. opposed to made up fringe right. in right. terms of okay. most fringe in these days is in the 40 range. And that includes the insurance, the retirement, all that kind of stuff, where a lot of places don't include that in, in their quoted fringe. Yeah. Um, so, so, Zoe, what I, I, I would... Sorry. It's, it's a good, good point. My husband point. asking if the dog is in the <laughs> But <laughs> we, we should also, we should also, if, if, if so something that we think about doing, we should also reach out to Conley once more. Because I, I think it, it's a different conversation if you look at Conway and Hatfield and Warren. Is two enough for all of those? If yeah. you had Hatfield, if you added both of those? I, I think currently, yes. Yeah. yeah, you could add Conway without I, adding. I, well, you would have, because if you can do one with three, you can do two with five if, if you just go straight I, math. I, I forget what the number was. Wasn't it 18 or 1900 runs? Then we start going into the. On the fringe of the third ambulance? It's something like that. I, yeah. And I, I can actually... I think kind of yeah. like, like about 120 runs. Okay, year. yeah. 
-hmm. So we'd still be able to cover everything with two rooms. So um, if you cite it, if you cite the other ambulance in another community, whether it's Hatfield or Whateley, where does it get cited? You mean like physically cited? Well, we'd have to do the. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, where your call yeah. concentration is. We, we look at we, what we did before is we found we found our populate we took the population, I'll put it on chart, downs. and they can they can put up in an algorithm and they can we we kind of know we knew where basically at the intersection five and ten one sixteen it was basically in that area we were pretty much in the in a sweet spot for a service in our three three populations. But I guess I mean there's another facility in the uh, the other costs, no? To it depends. So if we, depending on where the ambulance goes, if if Hatfield makes room in there, if it's determined it's going to go in the fire station in Hatfield, and you've got room for us to be there, and there's room for the staff to be there, then we would have to figure out what that cost is for the folks to be in that facility during the day. Prior to moving here, there used to be rent that was, it was a paper push back and forth, but there was rent for each <coughs> facility based on the square footage. And I think in, in Waitley and Sunderland, we just had an ambulance and inside, whereas South Deerfield had an ambulance and office space. So there was a greater rent paid to South Deerfield than there was Waitley and Sunderland. We would need to look at if you've got the facility there, great. If we don't have the facility... That's one of my concerns, is I don't know if we have the facility mm -hmm. for... If we want to even build it ourselves, that's one of my right. concerns. So if it, if you don't have the facility and we've got to build something, then it's a different conversation to figure out, okay, how are we going to do that? Where exactly? Based on your um, current population and the comps, I think we looked at runs over like a three-year period to figure out exactly where... The center was yeah you can see hot spots and I mean they pretty closely align with your population so right, yeah. right, right. So, course, you can so you know does it does it align with where your current fire station is or does it align you know GNS industrial out right. on five and ten right um, I don't know and, and the other complicated things too like just hypothetically you know town X you know wants to join but they're coming with a fully volunteer department yeah like if if the full-time department station is geographically seven miles down the hill, but their response times on scene are half of what it currently takes their volunteers to, you know, leave their job, go to the station, pick up an ambulance, and, and so that's part of that too. Um, I, looking at equalized values and populations, hypothetically, the five towns Conway's share would be 11%. So take whatever this really take whatever number is here um and then divide that you know that 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 surprises me that it surprised me that it's that low just because their population is consistent with Waitley's it's bigger than Waitley's actually I've got last one Waitley's um population is 1607 and Conway's as 1761 yeah so, but wait, we sure. Figured, oh, it would it would be eleven percent, not. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Never mind. Right, because Waitley's equalized value is three right. point three, and Conway's is two point nine. So those drag the other right. like I think averages we have more and land yeah. income. Yeah, than Conway does. Yeah. Um, so I, everybody's assessment would still go up, but it would go up by the entertainment district. Um, I. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just I'll just add that that I think that the region is best served by having these types of additions to an organization like SCAMS. I think it makes the region more appealing. I think it makes the five towns, if you include Conway, more appealing. For what it's worth, I remember having a conversation, and I forget his name, Tom. The guy who runs Highland, or Mike Rock Highland. Mike Rock? No. No, that's Hilltown. The fa the founder of the Highland ambulance. Tom, you know who he is. I mean, yeah, but I got Ted Baxter wrong. <laughs> yeah, I know. So anyway, this guy, this guy had done an analysis of all the different regional efforts in the area. And he said, you guys did it right because you got politics out of it. As much as I love poking fun at Deerfield. Deerfield. That's okay. You're allowed. It did get the politics out of it. Yeah. And that's critical. And yeah, you, and I you mean, maintain it's a it's a it's a charged you know it's a charged yeah. issue in town because, um, you know, people are 
feeling like we're taking away an ambulance service. Like we, you know, oh, you know, the select board is looking at doing away with ambulance in Hatfield. And it's like, no, what we're trying to do is make sure that there's reliable, reasonable, professional response. Our ambulance is phenomenal. Our department is phenomenal. Mm -hmm but that there's just capacity issues. Okay. And, and despite really heroic efforts to try to beef up their response, we're just still having the same so problems. So can I ask a couple of questions about your service? Um, you currently offer 24 hour a day service, but you have one ambulance. And do you know anything about re your response times and, and how much do you rely on you know, the larger community. So I, I, I don't have the exact yeah. numbers, just, but we do, we're, we're not staffed 24 seven. Okay. So we're currently, and I'm, I'm, there, there's been, we've been changing it and going back yeah, and no, forth, I, but I believe that right now we're staffed during the day with two full time. One just left, I, but I, I, I think the paramedic or the, uh, Bob is, the chief clarity is a paramedic and he's on all day. And the other guys at He's could be a first responder, BLS, no, BLS advanced. I think he's uh, maybe BLS. Basic life support. Yeah. Do you know if they're running an ALS level in Hatfield or not? They yes. are at the ALS yeah, level. Yeah, we are yeah. at ALS. Yes, I don't yes. know what they're, our standard staffing here is two paramedics <laughs> on the truck. Um, yeah. so but if Bob is sick, then that's then that that ambulance immediately goes down to a lower level, right? Assuming the other person isn't. There's, I mean, I don't know. Some yeah. other, we have had other yeah. paramedics able to respond, but um, I think there's you know they're moving or you know yeah. we're, and so what you know Northampton comes um, and you guys come sometimes sure. yeah. um, when there's not a response available, oh, and sometimes they're on another call. I mean, it's yeah. not like they're yeah. you know. Right. Um, sometimes there's just no one to do it, and sometimes it's because they're already on another call. Uh, but I, you know, I, I know that Northampton is coming. We've had, we've had, we, we, we had those exact conversations. Yep. We, we really did. And, and there was no harder conversation than we were in the frontier, right, the frontier uh, cafeteria. And we were... We, we, we took all kinds of questions, um, and then when we left, we, it was amazing because we had the answers, and just from our, just because of the conversations that we had amongst ourselves. And, and, and the, your, 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 your discussion that you're saying, the same exact conversations that we had, right. and we, we've been there. Yeah. And, and because we don't want to get, I mean, not, none of us wanted, none of us, we, we felt when we first started the same way. We, we were lucky. We had very good guidance. We had guidance from Bob O'Hearn, uh, Matt Russo, <clears throat> um, that, were in the, that were in the business, okay, and said, look, we don't want to do this, um, but it's not sustainable. And I think your guy, Bob, Right now, our chief, yeah, our chief. The, our chief. I should refer to him as chief. He, yeah. he, he, he's probably saying the same thing to you right now. When you look in the long term, at the sustainability. I think chief. chief. I think Chief Larry's really determined to try to do it himself, and he's he like I say, he's been really, really creative and really aggressive very, about it's very trying, strong. It's trying it's to yeah. find yeah. ways. If I may, and probably not a good question, how old is he? Chief Larry. Yes. Uh, I think he's early 40s. Oh, okay, so he's a pretty young guy still. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the, the, the will will go away at some point. People, people retire, people move on, people, and, 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 you know, all of a sudden he's got family, whatever it is. You, you can't look at this in the present snapshot in time. It, it will change, and in terms of requirements that the state places upon EMS level services, They've gotten stricter, and they're going to get more strict. Yeah, I Bob is very dedicated. Yeah, very dedicated. And you know, I think the important thing is, Bob has done nothing wrong. Oh no, your, no. your right. ambulance group, the folks who are responding have done nothing wrong. Right. The world has changed around us, mm -hmm. and what brought, what partially brought things to light for us. There had been a call in Old Deerfield. Police were up there on scene, and they were a great partner of ours. They would always show up. 
either ahead of us or just behind us to assist. And they waited up there just under an hour because they toned Deerfield, nobody responded. They asked for a truck out of Greenfield and Bay State Health at that point had nothing available. They toned Sunderland, they toned Conway, Deerfield had one person on, BHA responded, they had somebody, and by the time people got there, it was 45, 50 minutes, and the police officer was ripping because here I am standing here holding somebody's hand, listening to all this craziness go on, trying to get an ambulance to respond. And, you know, Bob at Hearn had similar stories in Sunderland, and it was what pushed us over the edge to say we need a different solution. We're, we've done what we can to try to bring this and serve the community. And I joked, I said it was, not joked, but I said, at the end of the day, it comes down to a choice for town members. You pay home insurance in case the house burns down, earthquake, flood, things go awry. You may never, ever use it. Ambulance is the same way. You're going to pay in case something bad happens, but if something bad happens, my comment was, do you want to spend the rest of your days on the front porch in the rocking chair or in the skilled nursing facility in a wheelchair? Because that's what the difference is. When our average response time for the entire area is just <coughs> over seven minutes. None of us had that good of a response time prior to that well, with our responders. Right. And that's an average, that's been going on multiple years now. And that includes addresses like Tom and myself that are on the fringes of, of the response area. Yeah. Zoe, I have a question about in the three in the three towns versus if we did have an agreement where all five towns came in, would that aid I mean costs would go up, but would that aid in staff retention? Um, you know, would that give benefits that we don't have now? Because you know, the police right now are having this thing where Chief Pachark is saying that all our guys are leaving. For bigger departments and, with a career um, track. And, and, yeah. and the people that are not coming into this field. Right, yeah. because of the chain, and, training requirements. You know, yeah. so, uh, I think absolutely. I think, I, I mean, nobody's interested in growing a department for the sake of growing it, right? Like we want to, I'm not going to use the term right size, but you need to make sure that you're appropriate, right? Um, but I think as you grow, like you said, you get that benefit where somebody who's looking to make that career, and paramedicine is a career, you got to make it someplace, and your options are private EMS, <clears throat> where, you know, maybe you're a union, maybe you're not, you're going to get through the ringer and you don't have retirement, or public sector, and it's either fire or EMS. Um, oh, it's typically fire, um, but if you don't want to be a firefighter, we've got that going for us. And then the downside we have here is that career growth, that career track, which is something we're trying to work on now, but right, like, oh, if, if I decide to settle in here for, you know, my 35 year run, am I going to retire doing the exact same thing? Or is there an opportunity for me to like make lieutenant and then make captain and get more responsibility and and you know grow myself as a leader and, and have some esprit de corps and stuff like that so i think absolutely um <coughs> and and that's part of what was i mean you'll see my calculations like i baked in there you know like supervisory you know stipends and stuff because you will need some additional mm -hmm. oversight i mean absolutely but acknowledging that yeah you're you're growing as an agency and you're um can I ask how it works? Because because one of the things you know, there's there's obviously been chatter in Hatfield among mm -hmm. residents. Both I've heard from people on both sides that it's time to just you know outsource or find a new solution. And certainly from lots of people who really want to retain our own ambulance um, service. <laughs> um, so and sure. one of the things they pe people are saying, some people have said a couple of people, like it it will tie the hands of our fire department because now if we if let's say ambulance is south county or it's northampton it's outsourced if you respond to a fire they're not allowed to do any kind of first aid or first responder is that true i think maybe it sounds like what you're talking about which is what i spoke to before which is if you look at amherst they do like thousands of the fire department does thousands of calls a year and 96 percent are ambulances 
right? But when they get a big fire, everybody that had been working on those ambulances are also firefighters. So they're able to staff the fire truck. Um, so that may be what, you know, like you, you need firefighters, but now you've outsourced your ambulances and so you don't have that, you know, group of individuals left to fight right. fires. But I'm gonna go back to that, like, you're robbing from one list to pay for the other because if they all jump on a fire truck, now you don't have anybody to cover the ambulance calls either. And so really to look at, you need to look at them separately. And so when there is a fire call in South Deerfield or Sutherland or Waitley, they call their firefighters and they respond and they are trained as firefighters, they are experts on that equipment and we respond as well and we are trained and experts as paramedics. And so we do firefighter rehab and we're available should somebody have chest pain that there is an ambulance that is staffed there immediately and we haven't robbed the people off of the ambulance in order to make up that ladder truck or okay. something like that. So because I think- It was sort of, what, the, what, what I heard as a concern was if there's a fire at Jonathan's and you three show up as firefighters and Jonathan needs some medical attention, they're not able to provide it. Legally? No, they would be. Able. They are legally required to be trained as first responders. That's what yeah. I so, yeah. um, And I think... Um, and stabilize or whatever right. until... Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, well, I kind of thought so. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of places will... And I'm like Northampton did this uh, to great success 10 years ago, which was they added ambulances and they sold it as saying, yeah, we're, we're paying for paramedics, but they're also firefighters. So we're getting, you know, twice well, the bang for Well, and that's one of the things Bob has been pointing out at our meetings, that if we build our own department, they're also firefighters. Yes. So we're now also creating a full-time fire department. Yeah. Um, which, which I think, I mean, there is, there is some validity to that. Um, I think, you know, it, it warrants doing the numbers, but I think that that is one of those, those things. I think whatever path Hatfield takes, and again, I'm biased, but I don't think it should be outsourcing completely to a private for-profit. Oh, you know, no, I don't think you know, Because I think a, a big thing, and certainly, I mean, everybody else can speak to it in the room, but the like this board of oversight, right? The ability for the community to have a say in the service that they're getting and how much they're getting for what they're paying. And, and public safety is just a value judgment. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. Like, I can give you a service, I'll design you a service you're gonna love, but you're gonna hate the price. Or I can give you a bargain, but you're gonna hate the service. And right. so figuring out where you are, that's a question that goes out to the community. And so the community having that ability, either if it's Hatfield Fire and Bob Flaherty has to stand up at town meeting, right, and, and explain and get feedback, or whether it's a board of oversight or whatever it is, I think that will be beneficial for Hatfield going forward, making sure that whatever relationship you have with your EMS is that you have some say in it. Sure, an example, Zoe, would be when, when, we, first, when we first put to, together and we had, we had an ambulance staff 24 seven. And we were finding that we were missing, because we, we'd go, we go over the reports and we were finding that there was many, we, we were paying money for intercepts. And well, Zoe, why, why are we having intercepts when we got a 24 seven paramedic? And, and Zoe said, well, if, there, if our ambulance is out, then you have to bring the ambulance in. So what Zoe um, brought before the Board of Oversight was, okay, we can have an impact shift. And, and an impact shift, and we said, well, what's this, explain the impact shift. And what it was is that you just, you have staffing for another ambulance during our historical, historically our largest call volume, which happens between, now I would six. guess it would happen at night, right? 10 to 6. And yeah. Zoe, Zoe ended up saying, and he did the 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. 10, yeah. 10, 10 a to 6 p. And we ran, we started running a, an impact shift from 10 a to 6 p. But how did that work if the ambulance was busy? Well, because we have multiple ambulances. Oh, so, you have multiple ambulances. Right. We have three, three ambulances. Oh, so, oh yeah, I yeah. thought you had one. No, no, no. no. So, no, no. Um, so right, staff. And that's a nice luxury to have. Yes. One is staffed 24-7, a second is staffed during those impact hours because, and that's also, I mean, that's one of the questions is when are your busiest when, call yeah. times? Because depending yeah. on whether you're a bedroom community or commuters or, or whatever, that's all gonna dictate as well. You know, the other thing, and I'm very biased in this, in this comment I'm about to make, and I'll probably get yelled at by any number of people from three towns. I think that the conversation around fire 
is perfectly fine to have now, but at some point, I don't know whether it's going to be in five years or when, there will be regional fire here. I, as, as long as the day is in the summer, I promise you, there will be regional fire someday when someone's house burns down that shouldn't have. And well, we're starting to see some regional police departments up in our western yep. little towns. And I think fire is going to happen before police, probably. But it's we, going we, to we happen. We talked about regional. Yeah. What's that? We talked. We talked. We've talked about it, and it just the conversation didn't go anywhere because Definitely. you're not in that evolutionary period yet. But it's going to happen. And so if, if you're a town like Hatfield that has, what do you have, 2,500 people? 34. 36. 34, okay. 34. Um, you're going to all of a sudden say, oh, now I have to regionalize both fire and ambulance because it's going to happen. Maybe not in our lifetimes, but it's going to happen. We're all going to live longer than five years. Exactly. No, I... <laughs> we had, when we... Jeez, John. <clears throat> before we went down this road in Deerfield, we went out to bid to private contractors. I think AMR declined to bid at the time, but... Bay State Health Ambulance submitted a bid to the town of Deerfield for no cost. They would cover all of our ambulance calls. We asked them, what does that mean? You could park a truck down here at the fire station. And their comment was, we could when we have one available, otherwise we'll be responding from Greenfield. And it brought up a lot of memories for folks who were in town before we started our own ambulance about waiting for our trucks to come from another community. Part of my concern as a director at the time was, at some point, we watched Mercy Ambulance become Bay State Health Ambulance, and we'd seen what was happening in the industry. My fear was at some point, some private company was going to gobble that up, and then we would have no control. And at that point, if you want to start an ambulance service, Right. Three hundred thousand bucks my, for an that's ambulance. That's my concern. Is I want to make sure we do the right thing and that it's right. a long-term solution because right. we don't want to get into a solution that only works for yeah. the first three years of a contract or five years and then we have to build an ambulance. Right. Service. Because because politics is instant gratification. Right. Your other challenge with building your own fire EMS service, and I don't, I don't have any dog in the fight, but if you look at what we're going through with our police. And I'm sure you're seeing it as well. They're leaving for bigger departments, bigger opportunities. How long well, there's is it no more part-time right. because yeah. of the training. Yeah, sure. So how long changes. is it going to be before the firefighter paramedics that you hire get sucked into a Northampton or an Amherst because there are opportunities? <clears throat> well, that's, you know, one of the things that Hatfield struggles with, and this is not exclusive to fire EMTs, paramedics, police, mm -hmm. it's across the board. We, we're just not competitive mm -hmm. with our wages. I mean, we're just a small town trying to do, you know, we have our own school system, remember. Right. And so we, we consistently struggle with being able to attract and retain. Yeah. And you, know, you and I have talked about this in the past, shrinking populations doesn't make that easier. And if anyone can mm -hmm. tell me that any of our populations are going to increase in the next 20 years, Either you've got a great marketing plan going on, or you are delusional. So our our population stays very steady and has for decades. Right. Our problem is, um, you know, people don't leave town. It's not a problem. I like to brag about it. Yeah. Just we there was a statistic years ago when the, in in a previous census, and I'm pretty sure it probably still holds pretty true. And that is that people who live in Hatfield have lived there longer than any other town in the Commonwealth. And that's because there's no reason to leave. Yeah. So people don't leave. And so there's no turnover of housing. So we have an aging population. Right. That's right. And we're running out of kids. Right. We're running out of kids. Right. So, but, but, so eventually, you will see a diminishing population. Because as the baby boom generation dies, and it's the largest generation population-wise, you will see a drop in population. I, I don't know. Because I think unique to our town, now this, this, is, this happens when... when people pass away, their family members move into the house and stay there. They, that's just, they, right. that's why houses don't go on the market. So people, but, it's just sort of like, people but again, will come back. Families of seven children 40, 50 years yeah, ago are now family, right. families of two children. Right. So it's just, you, you, demographics are demographics. Right. Yeah. 
I, it's a, I, it's a big it's a big thing that we need to tackle in mm. town and I just want to make sure we get it right mm. so my what I feel obligated to do on behalf of my residents is turn over every stone mm -hmm. what are our options if we do something with you folks what are our options if we do something with Northampton and what does it look like to do it ourselves mm -hmm. sure. What is what do we get in each scenario? What is the cost in each scenario? What does it do to response times? How does it the integration with the fire what, department? All of that. What do you I want to know. Response times now. You don't. You don't know. Pardon? That. You don't know what your response times are right I, now. I I have I don't have. One of those statistics. They're pretty good. Zoe, I think they're pretty Zoe, good Zoe, on they, the uh, the calls when we're able to respond. They're very good. So do they? Are they? Are they mm -hmm. kind of like us? They they you, know, you call nine one one. Then the first tone would go to Hatfield. Mm -hmm. If they don't answer with first or second tone, then they would go to their secondaries. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's I think they're toned four times. Um if you're this just gives you kind of an indication. And so if you are interested then you you know, it seems like you should call Zoe so that he can ask questions and then I can also we find think this? it may be a good idea for our consultant to um, meet with Zoe. I like I said, I love holding court. You know, you just ask me a question, and I'll go off. Um, What's your consultant rate to speak I'm, with consultants? I'm not. No <laughs> ethics. A position of public trust. I'm not allowed to make money based on my position here. Um, yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I've, I've got over 50 questions. Just and it's things like, how many times do you go mutual aid? How many times do you receive mutual aid? How many times, you know, is something dispatched and it turns out to be a paramedic level call versus how many times is it dispatched as a paramedic and it turns out not to be and and so there's a lot of a lot of that breakdown, which surely the the um, contractor, the the consultant, consultant would would parse through. They would have all those same questions, right. and that's, they would be able to that's, like that's their starting point. Yeah, is right. getting right. all of that right. information, and, and then to, certainly Chief Flaherty can answer. Yeah, and and I would think any consultant worth their salt would be able to turn around and be like, you know, this is what you need for EMS coverage. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you incorporate that into a a fire department or your police department or you contract it out but this is this is the standard that you would need to and achieve. I would I would offer for your chief if he's got any concerns any questions reach out. Uh, Bob and I are friends. I was I gonna say yeah. I was under yeah. the impression that the chief had spoken with okay. all of you. Yes Good yes deal. yes yeah no he, just he reached you out or to just me. not the whole no he reached out to me I was it back in October November probably um, okay. and and you know I, I basically I told him the whole like intermunicipal agreement thing I was like it's it's very complicated but it would it would look like this you know all three towns would have to agree and it would get divvied up based on percentages and stuff. we one of the one of the best parts about serving on this board and being a part of this and I can tell you there was quite a bit of um, discussion as Jonathan mentioned earlier there's two representatives from each town there was some discord in the town of Deerfield because they wanted to have three representatives on the board. I don't think we've ever had, we've had votes here that there's been one opposed and usually everybody else agrees, but we will sit at this table and we will continue to discuss and answer every question and understand every different side of it. And Tom's great because Tom is usually the voice of the opposite. He's the one who challenges us. He's usually the one who brings that other lens to the conversation to ask what if and sometimes it'll banter around 10 minutes sometimes it's two hours but before we take a vote we all understand the issue we all understand the implications and we all typically have come to agreement um, on what we're going to do to move forward i you know it it hasn't been contentious we'll all get passionate because we're passionate about caring for the people but it's also a service that has done a great deal of good, and I always feel like we're making a difference. And I, I, I've always thought our biggest job is to support Zoe and what he does, stand up for our crew that's here who does what they do on a regular basis. We need to make sure pay is competitive. We need to make sure that they've got appropriate living conditions, because if you pay them well and they're, they're in a hell hole, they don't want to come to work, they have no pride in it. The other thing is, You've got three ambulances sitting out there. The cost of an ambulance is now three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars. You don't want an angry employee going out and getting a three hundred fifty thousand dollar vehicle 
to race down the road. And at the end of the day, they're interacting with our town members. And the only thing I really want to hear out of town members is we call the ambulance and oh my god, what great people we have. Which is what we but, usually hear. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I wrote in it a year ago and it was right. fantastic. Yeah. But you know, Matt, the, but the one thing that I'll add is that we have this collegiality and we, we support Zoe and, and his team, but it's not at the expense of remembering to advocate for the community that you are sure. here representing. And that's the beauty of it. We all represent a different town. We all have different perspectives. We all have different budgets and populations and, you know, miles and road miles and all those kinds of things. And we can advocate for those things, <clears throat> but you're simultaneously advocating for the, for the common good. And that's what, and again, I'm biased, so take with a grain of salt. That's what you lose if you just become a subsidiary of a larger community. Because I know that was one of the things that made me nervous when we started to talk. I, w there's no way that people in Waitley were going to become a subsidiary of Deerfield. I think, uh, yeah, um, Hadley just went through this because they were contracting with Amherst Fire for, I mean, ages, and they were they were finally getting to the point where it's like, I, we respect Amherst, right? But like, there, it's a black hole. I call over there and I get the chief's assistant, and that's it. Or and, right, right, and there's no representation. There's yeah. no, and here you get. Representation. Hadley just started their, they're running their own, right? Yeah, the fire chief over there is like, you know, I, I can add firefighters if I make them EMTs as well, and they went down a path to, to try to do that. Um, yeah. I mean, how much does a firefighter EMT, what's the cost differential? I mean, if you're a firefighter, you get one wage. If you're an EMT, you get a different wage. Uh, every... Every municipality handles it differently. Um, I believe around here, like Northampton, I'm the most familiar with, you get hired as a firefighter, that is your job description, and then you get a stipend on top of that for being a paramedic, mm -hmm. which I'm biased. I think that's backwards, like I said about the education and training requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly if you look at the call volumes, you know, like 96 I was say, I know. I mean, um, I could see them getting a stipend to be an EMT, but yeah, to and, be a so, and, but I think a lot of that is just legacy, you know, like momentum. And so they'll do things where, like, a base firefighter makes $58,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And then you get a $10,000 stipend for being a paramedic. And then you get another $20 for every EMS call you go on while you're on shift. And then you get, you know, 2% more for a bachelor's. And then you get another 2% if you get a master's. And so they start doing that type of thing. And, um, That's a lot of labor rules, though, as well. Well, it's all collective bargaining right. and yeah. Yeah. stuff like that. So, so, are you unionized? No. no. Um, I, I like keeping those disciplines separate because also you're not you're not battling inside the department too for budget money and stuff like that. You know, when you're when like it's all up front, right? Like our training expenses here are for EMS training, right? And so we're not we're not you know. I don't know, blowing so, our budget on a ladder truck when really 90% of what we do is EMS. And okay. so you go to town meeting with your proposed three budget. Town meeting. Mm -hmm. All three town meetings. All three town meetings. All three town meetings. All three finance committees. Oof, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and each town, Deerfield, because they're the financial agent, they have to show the full budget, the full 1.3 or whatever, um, and balance that out with the revenues from the other member towns. But then... Sunderland and Waitley, they would just raise an appropriate whatever their share is. So yeah. currently, you have primarily a volunteer. Well, we we're, we're with some professionals that we we staff full two full time during the day, right? And then we're staffing one second shift. So what's your one. budget right now? Our I, budget. I, I, I didn't realize you had good question, Tim. So I didn't realize you had two full time staff already. Mm -hmm. So two to your budget has to be hundred fifty thousand at oh, least. Oh, it's more than that. Yeah, I think. just for the yeah. two people you're gonna have, including yeah. benefits. Yeah, it's probably. And it's to it's 20. also split among fire. It's there's in other words, part of Chief Flaherty's salary is paid by fire, mm -hmm. part by ambulance. Um, you know, I don't have it committed to memory. We just yeah. sat down with him and went over all of his proposed stuff. We we've greatly increased it over the last couple of years by pumping some ARPA money into it, which, which is ending now. So now we don't have it. So now we're, look, we're looking at, for this year, we're probably going to have to ask for an override just to keep status quo while we look at all of this. Um, 
But we're probably looking at an override for the police department and most certainly for the school department. Oh, the, the other thing is when you when you talk to your when you talk to your consultant, there there's and again we're getting into weeds right now, but there's three or four um, models that you can use for funding your ambulance EMS system, and and that's really important. And, be, and, and understanding what each of the models bring to the table. And we got perfect example, you got South County, you got Highland, and you have Colerain. That it kind of diff, to provide sort of the same thing, but the funding mechanisms are different. And that, that'd be kind of, you, you really need to look at the, how it's funded, how, how they're funded. Because Highland does a lot of, um, Go out and fundraising. Get yeah, fundraising. I think both of them are technically nonprofits. They are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so I think. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It is. That, that's why. That's why I said. And and if you have an, and it's, it'd be a, probably a good thing to talk to the directors about what they look. There's a pluses and the minuses of the systems that they're in. But I think that that is a kind of a great conversation to have we learned a lot because we those are questions that we we, we we were talking about we I learned I know particularly myself learned a whole bunch about the different ways that they're funded and what works a little bit better or maintains continuity so I, I, I would look at how, how that thing but that's interesting when Tim asked that question I, I guess I didn't realize that you had two already two full-time plus others because that that's not like Zach's number is four hundred thousand, whatever it is, but it's not like that would be instantaneous. More, it'd be a just like, incrementally more. So say if you you're waiting, it, it, it's yeah, it, yeah it, it would be, but then it's also twenty four seven. Yeah, we don't have twenty four. Right, right, right. So like if you were already paying one hundred and fifty, and you're talking about forty five thousand. Oh, we're, 000, we're way more than. Yeah, I bet you're two fifty. So. Right, so you're looking at a cost. Bet, you're looking at yeah. a cost reduction. We're looking at selling a, basically a two hundred thousand increase to mm -hmm. our residents. So yeah, right. you guys have the problem of, well, what are we going to do with our loyal employees? You know, you're blah, 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 or, whatever. Or, or if you need a fire our, truck, what yeah, are you going to do? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Yeah. Losing this, losing that. We're looking at, well, we're, you know, so, you know, but we would be getting more, as Zach sa as Zoe says. But, you know, it's going to be a hard conversation for all of our communities, not just yours. Right. right. Well, Tim, but, but hers would go up. Right. Well, right. what I'm saying is, oh, that yeah. yeah, whatever weight leads, those are the things you have to figure out. What but are you dedicating I to? I bet they're close to 300. Yeah. yeah, but they're, they'll, they'll go up. She'll go up by 25, 30 percent. We'll go up by 30 <clears> percent. <throat> I think everyone goes up by about 30 percent. Well, Waitley's, that's the beauty of Conway. Waitley's coming in here. This number assumes that it, say you're spending 300,000 a year for these services. You're under this scenario, and I know it's just a spitball. It's not mm -hmm. reality. Yeah. You're actually getting a good deal, right? Because you're getting twenty four seven, right. right? So, and it's the cost is going down. If you're paying three hundred for what you're doing now, I don't know what that is, but maybe it's less than one hundred ninety five. For the rest of it, it's not the same calculus. Mm -hmm. uh, right. One, well, and, and that's why we, why I always present the budget the way I do. You know, this is the service you've asked for. This is what it costs: two million dollars. But if we go through the calculations, it's only costing you, right, whatever. And then at that point, right, yeah, right, like Deerfield, $200,000. I mean, that's not insignificant. I mean, no, that's, that's a huge, huge. increase. Three hundred. But you're getting 100, huge. right, but you're getting 100% more <coughs> service available. So then the yeah. question is that value judgment again. Like, where I are as, you? I yeah. as an individual say, two chances to get an ambulance within seven minutes of uh, getting the treatment's going to keep me from walking or being an invalid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I make that judgment myself and say, no problem. Okay. But other people say, what? Right. 200000 and, you know, what are we getting for? Yeah. Uh, obviously, part of its ability to pay. Yeah. Or your personal mm -hmm. financial situation. Exactly. And we all have to be aware of that yeah. and yeah. sympathetic to that. But, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, we are a community. Yeah, and I'm just saying that we have to be realistic that our, our communities could say no because yeah. of just that price bump. Yeah, uh, right. And you know, part of our argument when we sold this initially was, how many of you drive through Waitley, Sunderland on a regular basis? Do you want to be in that auto accident in Sunderland and not have this go through and in there. You know, <laughs> exactly. wind up waiting in your car for 35, 40 minutes for EMTs to show up? Try living in my house and the world goes parked by my house and no one, none of them live in Waitley. Yeah. Her, accident, <laughs> her accident was right on your street, you know. 
You were on Swamp Road? Well, I, the, the, the gentleman came shooting out of Swamp Road. And Up I top was or down below on 5? Oh, you were on 510. Yeah, right. So he, he sailed. He would have, I, I don't know what was going on because he would have, he didn't stop at the stop sign. It's hard to sail through that. It oh, honestly is. Oh, no, he did. Oof. Mm -hmm. So he went right in front of us. So instead, of, he didn't come out and hit us this way. The timing was like this. So we hit head on. Mm. At full speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yikes. Mm -hmm. mm, scary. But your 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 um, ambulance was there. Seconds. It felt like seconds. Seriously. I mean, it was right down the street. Mm -hmm. well, you know, um, and part of that again becomes mm -hmm. that story that you tell about when you're a volunteer right. and that tone goes off. The first one, you kind of shake in the cobwebs right. out to right. wake up, right. orientate yourself, listening to see on. if someone else is responding. Get socks on, get dressed, stop in the bathroom, you know, downstairs. If it's wintertime, is your car outside? You have to scrape the windshield before you can go. Now the second tone's going. And when you're that person sitting at home or in the emergency waiting, minutes feel like hours. Mm -hmm. And the scenario you just painted, alone is seven minutes. Yeah. Alone, never mind driving to the station, getting in an ambulance, and driving to... Right. right. Well, and this is, you know, kind of want for a better word, but those volunteers are volunteers yes. too. You know, like they yeah. don't they don't yeah. do it every single day. They don't read the you know the medical journals right. while they're on shift. They don't, and they you know, do a great so. job. They do an amazing they're job. Amazing job. Amazing job. But I, do I want a volunteer lawyer or do I want the full time lawyer? You know, like that type of thing too. Well, like the NFL, with their officials. Were they volunteers? Almost. What is it? Uh, they get per diem. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Well, this has been, you know, really Her interesting. This segment. is this is interesting, and I, I, you know, I understand. What's interesting to me about this is just sort of the, the, rough breakdown. Not necessarily the num the the dollar mm -hmm. numbers, mm -hmm. but the percentage numbers yeah. is Good. interesting. Good. I, you know, Hatfield, we're we're gonna have to make a, a decision, if, and and if people, if people decide that they want to build our own in house full time department, then we'll do that. But we have, I just feel it would be doing a disservice mm -hmm. to not give all the options. Mm -hmm. What are your options sure. here and, for? And so. I would argue that your window to make this decision, if you want it to be fiscal 25, needs to happen late summer 23. Right. So you don't, otherwise it's going to get kicked to fiscal 26. So you're just right. going to go to special town meeting. You yeah, right. to, yeah. And you got to sell it. You, you, yeah. it's not just a town meeting, it is a road show. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, me, Tom, and, and Mark, and I mean, we spent God knows how many painful hours with each other. I, 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 I thank you for coming to talk to us. I, 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 I think appreciate that, I think that's just, it's, it's the first step. Um, every one of us, Matt, just just so you know, Matt and I did not when we first started off. We did not see eye to eye, and not I hated him. Right? <laughs> but but, well, but, was but what I but what I can tell you now is that for the last three summers, we uh, tied our boats one another, and, and our families have a wonderful time together. So and, and and I would say that that that, that was because it. That's Do you not get invited, invited yes. to the boat? See, I knew it. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna really get incensed when they don't invite. You get you invited, you don't show up. <laughs> that's, but, that's, but that's that's because of the respect that we have for one another. Average, because we didn't. If you asked, if you ten years ago, if you asked us where we'd be today, and we told you we'd have what we did to what we have now, I would say there was a snowball's chance in hell. Right. Be, because it's far, it has far exceeded any of our our wildest expectations. Actually, I, I don't agree with that. I think we I all know. envisioned this right from the beginning. Otherwise, we wouldn't have committed so much time to this. I, I thought, well, I, I agree with you, and I disagree, like you're m normal, but I, I think when we first, <laughs> but when we first, but when we first started, I, I think we had so, we, we felt we the first three years was critical. That we didn't know if we were going to last past three years. So well, you know that. And, and it had oh, some yeah. tough, and it had some, I mean, we were doing it 10 years ago. We were putting right. this thing together 10 I, I No, this we, was already 10 oh, years okay, old. Come on, John. It was 20, 30, 30, right, right, I'm sorry. But, 
I, I, I remember I, defending it on town meeting floor like two, three years in. Uh, right. Right. Well, we've and, and always had to defend. You know, we've always had to defend. And this. we almost broke up three years in. Tom and I had our finest moment at the Salt Sunderland transfer oh, transfer station. God, the what do you call your building there? Fire station. The 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 you know, Public literally on camera, swearing at each other. And they weren't what were swearing. Oh, oh, exactly. <laughs> but. But what what and, and at on on like I guess what I'm trying to say is that you you have to do your due diligence um what what you're doing now, but you your understanding it, it's more it's much more complicated. It's it's much more complicated than just looking at a piece of paper. It, it, because and to our, me it's more complicated than just bringing on staff. There's yes. a lot of other yes. components it, it, that we have to think about. And it, it is an emotionally charged because yes. we are all, you know, we're, we're in Hatfield, we're very proud of the different departments we built. We're, yeah. we're attached to the employees that are working mm -hmm. in them. We're, you know, grateful to Chief Flaherty, to his wife, to this whole crew of mm -hmm. firefighters and, and sure. EMTs that he has. So there's... Um, you know, it's it's a lot to sort of... I let John to beat me up all the time. I sit here politely. We were. <laughs> also, you all know, the love in the world. If you go, you if you and go and talk about Deerfield percentages in the budget, and then yeah, okay. <laughs> if you stay independent and you lose one person, the effect on your situation is much more drastic than if Zoe loses one right. person. Right. And, you know, your whole department could fall apart if you lose one person. Right. Well, and, we, you know, we're, it's even a matter of trying to figure out, like, what... If we build a full-time department, yeah. you know, 24-7 full-time, right. what does it do to our workers' comp premiums? This is a job, as you well know, mm -hmm. that is very prone to mm -hmm. injury. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not just a matter of it yeah. costs this much in salaries. Right, exactly. And, it, and it, you know, we, we our facility, you know, may not be adequate. And I, I think we're way behind the times. We should have had a, a new facility a long time ago. And I would personally check a box, yes, to vote for all of these things. But I'm, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. I have to give people options of yeah. mm -hmm. what yeah. different I, and, options and of. The and one what, thing I would tell you though is that if, if if you do if you do go with your your own and and if you do go with your own combined service fire with ambulance or, or whatever, right? I I. It's not you really not a fire department. It's an it's an EMS that makes fire runs. Um, because I I can there, there's lo, there's a local very large department, and I've seen them waiting for ambulances to come back down Route Nine so they would have enough manpower to attack a fire. fire. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. I, I've also reckon, I also see there's certain things that, that that group doesn't do now because they're not able to train um, sufficiently to do those tasks any longer. Um, so it, it, it's just and it, it's just different, okay when you start doing it trying to do yourself because when you're smaller and, and earlier we talked about regional fire and whatever, I, I don't know if it's as eminent as some may think. I, I I know though that if we had something like that, we could probably there are certain things that we do maybe better. But your comments earlier about your people, with our whole time that we had the conversation was what do we do with our our EMS? How do we keep them involved? How do we keep I, I mean that was this guy's big one of his biggest concern and Bobby's concern is because we had what 20 EMTs 15 20 EMTs paramedic and we wanted to keep them involved but when nothing was nicer than here that when they, they say well he's how come you're no longer involved it says well I watch what these guys are doing they they get it so it, it's just it's a hard decision yeah. It's a hard decision. We were also very fortunate that we had the leader of the service that we do, yeah. who's remained on, yeah. and was able to take all the concerns, all of the politics, 
all of the everything else going on and develop a service, keep the morale up, keep the standards up, and be brave enough and honest enough to bring us the challenges that were going on in the service so that we could help support. We look to our chief for recommendations. I mean, we sat here at the last meeting and were informed that the life pack machines, the cardiac monitors, the company who produced them no longer can support them. They were like, oh my God, you know, and Zoe was looking at, you know, putting in the budget for two years from now. We're like, we no. can't wait two years. There's a backlog. It's going to take him 18 months to two years to get new machines. We're voting tonight, and we made the recommendation, go ahead and let's By get the way, them I more. brought it up to the Capital Improvement okay. Committee, and they're fine with it. Thank you. So I mean, it's not formally voted yet, but yeah, it will, going but through the process, it's fine. It's those kind of things where we have that discussion and dialogue. To your point about the workers' comp, I'm a big one for safety. When they first came out with those battery-operated stretchers, what do they cost? It's a safety issue. Put it in. Let's go. Let's go get them. If I can save one back injury, they'll all pay for well, themselves. I think like we even. I mean, yeah. I mean, we've experienced that firsthand. I mean, the stretcher and the power load together were like thirty thousand dollars, and you know we staggered the bill that, or like the one truck got it, and we staggered it. And in that time, we had one back injury, and I think it cost us forty something thousand, and you know, like expenses and backfill and all that stuff. And, yeah. So it's part of that taking care of the people that are here. And not that I'm saying if you do your own, you won't. And no matter what you do, if we can support, if we can help, if we can answer any questions. So that was a question of advice. mine. What would, because I, I think townspeople will ask this, what if we build two shifts and hire you for the overnight? Is that a possibility? I think anything is possible, though I don't know. You, we, uh, that's a staffing model issue. I mean, we'd have to figure out whether we could even cover it. Right. And if we could, what the impact on our... Because we're not, we're not for profit, right? We, this is how much it costs for us to do, and this yeah. is how we share the costs. So, like, basically, you'd be like... we don't have transport, you know, transports to... There would be... Um, I mean, you're basically right. talking about, right, like, right, contracting. Essentially, would be contracting. Yeah. Yeah, right. it would be primary... Right. The yeah. overnight yeah, shift. It, it just a, we'd, you'd have to run run numbers. My my. You'd have to bring on a second ambulance. My my operational concern right. would be I'm that. Sure you do. Uh, we, we, my concern wouldn't be the expense as much as right making sure that we right. we weren't decreasing the limits for yeah. all, yeah. all the yeah. tasks yeah. in order. Yeah, yeah. 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 Be saying something like, okay, if we have one oh, shift, yeah. if we have one shift on at night, and. A call goes out and they go to your town, and then somebody in our community, wow. you know, yeah. lacks the service. Right. Yeah. It's one thing if they're already. You're going have to bring to on another crew. Yours or right. So it, it may not be. If it would, when I it would be a crew that would yeah. probably need to sit at their station. station. I, do they use air ambulance? Sorry, ambulance. What's the, what's the, what's the difference of? You know what I mean? Like I don't. I, don't I, I, don't I, mean, I just well, know that people are down to You would just say right now, assessed to the member towns is. Uh, seven hundred thousand, and so to add that second truck, you just have to. We charge another seven hundred thousand bucks. Goes out. It's easy. It's easy math. For one shift? Yeah, no, that's easy math. <laughs> yeah, that's one numbers. The box. See, because I was we thought about that long, and I think yeah. I've the economy yeah. of scale. So, well, this has been, you know, great. Maybe a starting point. Nice to see you, yeah, so nice to see you. I mean, who? You know, I just, I don't know. I'm. I feel very confident in the the gentleman. Um, it's. Um, David Hot Houghton. I don't know okay. if, if you know Fireside at all, but he's a retired chief from. Okay. It's, I'm, I'm assuming that his experience is fire based EMS or something like We are the only municipal EMS third service in the Commonwealth, so we're very, very unique. So I want to make sure that you know that if he has any questions or you have any questions about EMS as a third service, like. We can answer those. Okay. We, we are a resource. I have a feeling he's going to want to spend time both here in Northampton yeah. mm -hmm. to to understand, yeah. um, you know, because he's going to want to do a report of the different scenarios we yeah. have. Yeah. Absolutely. If if yeah. you know if if this is a viable option, no. okay. but I've appreciated the time. It's really been interesting to learn about the service and. Bruce Baxter is currently the president at Connecticut EMS Chiefs Association in New Britain, Connecticut. Yep. 
That sounds about right. He's, he's on not LinkedIn. Good golfer either. Okay. So if you. Mm -hmm. I'm not, not on there. Can oh, you believe it? You know what? I, I can forward I you those Baxter reports you. that we received. Oh, anyway. okay. Yeah. 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 Not, oh. nothing against <laughs> your, me. you're better for us. <laughs> nothing against your current <laughs> consultant, but if you wanted to talk to Bruce, so we will forward you some of the reports that he had sent to us so that you've got the information. And I guess it's also, we're presuming a scope of the, I mean, it could, if, if the scope of that assessment too is like, full-time fire as well obviously yeah, yeah, it's very different. well that's not what we're what we've asked him to look at, okay but that would be according to chief Flaherty a side benefit yeah. of building this I, I, I'll say this I'll, I'll, the third time I'll say it plus I'll add a little thing it's all value judgment about what your community wants and what they're willing to pay for um, and the math is easy really I mean like you know it's easy to say this is what that will cost so it's just yeah it's just asking the questions really yeah I just want to make sure people get a level of service that they're comfortable with. For us, it was easier because all three EMS directors were on board. And we eventually. Had, eventually. <laughs> and we had support of select board members. And we checked, as we built this thing, we tried to check the ego at the door when we walked into the meeting. And to Jonathan's point earlier, what's the best, what's in the best interest of the three towns? Once we broke the walls down, of what's in my best interest and made it what's in the best interest of everybody involved. Right. Yeah. And things like that. Yeah. Well, you know, we're all charged with protecting our certain yeah. people and services and you know I understand. we we do in Hatfield like to do our own thing. Sure. We do. That's why we have that little school system. Wonder oh. it's wonderful. And my last one is graduating in a few months, and you know, so it is. A, it, we, you know, we have an, a, a unique little town. Mm -hmm. So I've appreciated the time. Do you also have a whole nother meeting? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so I was just try to cut as short as possible. Oh, Mr. there's chair. So I will excuse myself, but thank you so much. It was nice really to nice to see you. Nice to meet nice you. To meet yeah. you. Yeah. Nice to Great see to you. Great to see you. Nice Pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I wonder if it's freezing out there. <coughs> oh, we're well, I came in it was coming down for well. Thank you very yeah, much. I'm going to I'll give you my of the last meeting. Has my work in there. Motion to accept. Minutes. I'll second the motion to accept the minutes uh, as presented. This, this oh, any discussion on the last uh, minutes? Not hearing any Welcome discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. I, I have four zero. I wasn't here. You can vote. The governor said you can I, vote. I know, but ethically. He can, he just never wants to. I guess I'm going this Three way. zero. Three, Three zero. zero. One. Three zero no, one. Oh, no, no, I can't to vote. Two. Thank you. Wait, oh, no, then I'm just not going to vote. Five. 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 Three zero. Three, I? That's why I said. Three zero. Okay, fine. An ascension is a vote. Okay, all right. Um, We're going to expedite this. Uh, we keep walking or coming around on this, Carolyn, and I'm putting my foot down kind of hard. Um, which one? I, the first responder training is just not something, at least certifying in first responder, that South County can take on and provide for the other public safety agencies in the area. Um, the biggest hurdle is that you would have we would have to uh, become a training site, and so no, they aren't handing those out anymore. They're, the area is flush with training sites and its affiliations with the American Heart Association, American Red Cross. Um, but moreover, this is, uh, this, is like, this is like asking a weld shop to become a trade school. That like, well, you're already doing it anyway. Why don't we just you know, teach some people on the we side? Don't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to um, a training facility. I, the, I guess I, I wonder, this has been a requirement since the late 70s. And I'm being kind of snarky in my director's report, so I don't know. I don't know what the departments had been doing that now has fallen through. I'm happy to work with them and try to coordinate. Um, I reached out to Melnick; he didn't call me back. He reached out to David, and I think the relationship that David we had been doing, where where he would go over to like the senior center and the library as a South County EMS employee, and as an instructor you know, give cards or whatever. Um, he was acting as an instructor through Community 911, so his, his side job. Um, and 
that is getting a little tenuous because these requirements for maintaining these level of training and certification is getting to the point where they don't want him basically being an instructor for us, but signing their name to the cards. Um, plus he's retiring soon anyway, so. Um, so, so the will have nobody that can do CPR and any first aid training? We, so we have people who work here who are instructors for outside organizations, but South County in and of itself cannot issue a certification. Um, and so to do that, what, what it would entail for, for us to... We would have to align with the American Heart Association and the American Red Cross, and they will not let us do that. There are too many training organizations already um, in the area, so they limit... They basically limit access. Um, and in, in order to be an instructor, you have to be affiliated with an aligned organization. Um, but the courses are available through, does GCC still offer that? Or so, is it just Community 911? I mean, Community 911 is one of the options. I keep getting, this is, so getting, it is. it has been Massachusetts general law since 1978 that all firefighters and police officers be certified as a first responder within one year and then renewed every two to three years thereafter. And so if there is some crisis that is occurring now amongst the local I, fire departments? Well, I just think it's, it's really expensive, and, and I think that's what's, you know, if we can offer that through our trained personnel. Uh, in order for us to become a training organization, say, hypothetically, another organization goes out of business and there is, like, a training site affiliation available to us, not unlike a liquor license or a topless marijuana license. Um, Where is that going? I don't know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> even if that were to happen, we would have to have a facility capable of training. We would have to have the requisite instructor to student ratios, which is normally one to seven. So you could train seven people at a time unless you can find more instructors. It's about a thirty to forty thousand dollar investment on training equipment that you would need, um, and then you would have to make sure that that is renewed. Um, both things like CPR mannequins, which do wear out, but also you must replace. Which those are expensive. Very, and they're and they're With getting the more. Software. Yes. Hundred thousand dollars. And then there are expendable supplies like the first aid supplies that you know they have to be able to use and, and all that yeah. stuff. The curriculum itself, first responders, a fifty-six hour curriculum, and there is not a recognized refresher course. So technically, that is hosting a 56-hour training every two years is the American Red Cross recommendation, three years in Massachusetts general law. Um, and so realistically, for us to become a training organization, we would have to hire full-time staff to administer that whole business. I mean, it is a separate business, right? Um, the Massachusetts Police, Municipal Police Training Council, MPTC, all police officers go through annual in-service recertification. They have folded first responder training into that. That is paid for by the state. And so they have their own physician medical control director that basically writes their own curriculum and signs off on it. So I think the police are all taken care of. That is part of their minimum training requirements and counted towards those hours. So that leaves the fire departments. Um, and with, I mean, it just the standards of training, the first thing, if anything were to ever happen, right, heaven forbid on a scene, what's the first thing that, that the plaintiff's lawyer looks for is training records, right? And so um, the days of kind of like, oh, this is a non-rebreather, we all remember how to use that, great, you're recertified for another two years. I mean, that's, that's a thing of the past. Um, and, and just to bookend it, I, I mean, we, because the lift is so great to offer trainings and certifications, South County contracts it out. I mean, seventeen thousand dollars a year for an outside company to handle and facilitate and maintain all of those requirements. So we can just call them up and say, "I've got four people that need to go through ACLS," and they go, "Okay, no problem. Send them down to my simulation lab, you know." And then they they use the monitors and stuff like that. So, um, it's it's a thing that like 
has been a wonderful service that we could provide because we had instructors in ha house, but even <coughs> that relationship to kind of be able to backdoor an actual certification through an outside organization is, is becoming a thing of the past, um, just because they don't have the, the control over it, okay. which is unfortunate. Um, uh, this is not, though, to say that we don't regularly train and meet with the fire departments and the police departments and review things like our stretchers and first aid and backboards. I mean, that's all things that we are normally doing. We just can't issue them a certification in it. Um, if, Just, can you just follow up with Darren? Yeah, I, I will. He can. He's got my number. He hasn't called me back. I will call. I will call him again. Um, because and the other thing, um, because it's a requirement for everybody. I mean, certainly there can be. If all the, you know, some of them, Waitley and Deerfield, South Deerfield Fire Departments got together, I'm sure they could organize something. Or I don't know what Greenfield Fire does. You know, they, there must be. There are systems in place already for all of this stuff, so the question is just connecting those dots. Um, FY24 budget, the most recent one there, uh, dated February 16, version 6. Um, the numbers updated are the benefits. We are looking at a 6% increase in health insurance costs. Um, That's because we have more staff. That is part of it, um, but the, the uh, I was, to, I mean, one is we have more staff. The other thing is that I guess those actual benefit costs went up 6% uh, is what Brenda relayed to me. So that went up, but workman's comp went down because we are safe and we do training. And Which pages are you looking at? You're looking at your computer, so are we talking about the, Yes. The so so yes. the medical insurance line at it. Yeah. And, it, and it's funny, not funny. <laughs> funny haha -ha or funny hee <laughs> hee? It, it's, I mean, it was a pretty good hike from 22 to 23, and then it's a really good hike from 23 to 24. Yeah. So I'm wondering what the trend lines are in terms of. Uh, so the medical insurances, we hired two more full time. Um, one of them, I know for certain, is on the town's uh, insurance and has just expanded to a family plan, is my understanding as well. Okay, yeah. Um, and then the retirement costs, that's just reflective, too, of, you know, the increased wages, um, steps and colas, and the increased staff. Uh, okay. Yeah, because that's a big, that's a... Yeah. 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 Um, this is going to be hard for mm -hmm. us. Um, I know we've talked about the overtime, but can we... Is there any way that we can cut the overtime? We can draw out the holiday pay from that, and I can cut that overtime line item by half. Well, I know that the holiday pay is like 50, so we're talking about 70-ish mm -hmm. for um, you know the work overtime. Can we cut that in half? I, I, I'll say again, so that averages to... I know it averages, but... I, is so, there a way that it's a that, so it's total department wide that overtime is a thousand hours a year. So that's half of what an additional full time person would cost, um, and it is all like late calls, early calls, um, and emergency call out stuff. So if, explain, explain to me why it's fifty thousand dollars bump. So. Let me see the short answer. Because of the town bylaws, holidays are paid at an employee's regular rate. So any week, such as this week, President's Day, everybody's pay sheet has eight hours for President's Day on it, yeah. and then they enter their hours worked. So they're scheduled for 40 hours, and so their pay sheet ends up showing 48 hours, so it's eight hours of overtime. 13 observed holidays in Deerfield, times eight times 10 gets you to a thousand something overtime hours paid that are just for holidays. The employees are still it's only working 40 they... hours that week. Yeah. Because the service doesn't shut its doors on holidays. Right, but it's only the people who work that holiday who are getting the... Everybody in town gets those 13 paid holidays and we're not allowed to float. We're not allowed to take a, um, like a, 
Yeah, fine, but I get if someone is working a 40 hour work week, mm -hmm. okay, Monday through Friday, you make it easy. Yeah. And the Monday's a holiday. Yeah, it's gonna be 48 hours. But if someone's work schedule is Tuesday through Saturday, they sh They still work 40 hours and they get the eight hours for Monday. Why aren't they getting the eight hours for the Monday? They don't want to schedule to work that day. Because it's a holiday. It's a holiday. Everybody, Everybody gets a holiday. holiday. The teachers are all off this week. Are the teachers getting paid for a holiday on Monday? Probably. Okay. Let's just it doesn't out. make me Jonathan, have to like it. Jonathan, I know you don't have I'm not to like talking, it. Jonathan, we're not talking about that 50. We're talking about the 70. One thousand. So on the top actual of the fifty. The actual overtime hours worked above and beyond forty hours a week averages per employee to just over two hours a week. Um, so across all employees, that's a thousand hours a year, um, and that is represents. So you work a seven to three, and you got a call in at two forty five, and so you go on the call, you get held over, and then you get your overtime or. You're coming in 3 to 11, um, you need to meet with the chief, so hey, I need you to come in at 2.30, you know, see me that type of stuff. So, um, or, or an additional, none of that, but like another eight hours a month. So an emergency call out, you know, on the, at 7 a.m. and they hold over or something like that for four hours. Okay, so, all right, so unfortunately he's making me think, and I don't like when he makes me think, but... <laughs> So, so I work Monday through Friday, right? I'm scheduled to work. I was scheduled to work on Monday. I don't come into work because I, I, I have a holiday. So my salary should already be figured into your overall budget. So that person should only be getting paid 40 hours for that week, not 48 hours. But, so I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I was off Monday, I get paid for Monday, but my total hours are only 40 hours, not 48 hours, right? I, I, you're but on my side. I, if you were off on Monday, yeah. then you're going to work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, which is only 32 hours, where are you going to get your other eight hours to make the up holiday. the 40 hour week? The, the, but, but that was a, that was a my normal salary. That's yes. but right. We don't close on holidays. Yeah, but what happens if the guy decides But everybody's not working either. Right. You're paying people for not working. But everybody gets paid the holiday whether they're working or not. So normally your front staff would only physically come into their, their office 32 hours that week, right? Yes. We need them to come in 40 hours this week, but they're still entitled to holidays now, and the bylaws state that holidays shall be paid at the regular rate. And we can't, we can't give them floaters. Like, I, I, like I, the police in their collective bargaining, they say, okay, like I'll have an additional 13 eight-hour days that I can move around and I'll take my president's day this week or something, which is great because you can plan ahead and you can make sure you have coverage and you can move people around. Um, we can't float, we can't move them, so when you hit, so everybody this week, they can. So everybody's getting 48 hours this week? If they don't, if they don't take the time. So what do you mean if they don't take the time? If they, so if I tell them, so if I tell them they can't come in, right, and everybody only puts in 32 hours, yeah. I have 80 hours of coverage that I need, and so, the options are either then offer their shift to another full-timer for overtime or try to find a per diem who will work it, who, because holidays are paid at the normal rate, has no incentive to come in on the holiday, say Christmas, because they would only get their normal flat rate here. Um, right. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, get, I get that. So and, what we do is- I we thought it was state law that you had to pay time and a half for holiday, but I guess not. Well, we do. It's, it, it's entered into your timesheet as a regular eight hour block, which is at the regular rate, which means that when your timesheet shows 48, I, okay. Th this is not something that I'm doing because like, this is what I've decided makes the most sense. I understand that. <laughs> Just but, so but, but I guarantee you if, 
if the person who has an hourly job at XY, XYZ Corporation. Right. Not everybody in that company is getting paid 48 hours for the work week. The people who are getting paid, they're, they're probably getting paid time and a half or double time for working that shift. But not everyone in that. So I would argue that the Deerfield policy is a very expensive policy and perhaps is not friendly. They actually want it, was it meant to be. This is, yeah, so this bylaw has been this way ever since I remember. I mean, it's like at town meeting, 1970. Sure, something. so you're, you're paying, so basically, you're paying every, you're paying, so when, and again, I go back, I go, and, and you're going to help me with it. Maybe I'm missing something. That's okay. But but if I'm, if I work a 40 hour week, and, and I don't work Monday, I'm off on a holiday, I don't come in to work on Monday, but my paycheck will only say 40 hours. I'll get paid for 40 hours, not 48 hours. Because it just happened. Yeah, if you were off on Monday, yeah, and yeah. you only work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, yeah. 32, 32, hours. 32 hours, plus the eight hours holiday, you've got your 40 hours. 40 hours, yeah. right. He's saying he gets 48 hours. Because they're working Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Even, no, no, even the people that aren't working are getting paid. To but the hours. ones who aren't working Monday, who are off Monday, have either worked Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or they're working Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They're working, they're physically working 40 hours plus getting the eight hours. You're talking about physically working 32 hours, yeah. getting your eight hours holiday. We don't shut the lights off and close the building and say it's a holiday we're not working for. Right, right, I get that. So they're going to make up, their, they're going to have their full 40 hours somewhere along the line and have to get paid for that holiday. I'll think about it. Okay. I, I would love, so but when we adopted the 13th holiday and the question came up, like, does this affect the budget? And everybody's like, no. I was like, are you kidding me? That's enough. Of course it does. <laughs> yeah. What was the 13th holiday that we? Juneteenth. 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 Well, yeah. I mean, I totally support the holiday, but like this oh, yeah. had a significant impact. This had a significant impact on our budget. Um, so, but, I, um, I, yeah. Okay. It, so it. It is what it is. No, it's not. I, I, I feel like we should be able to cut the. Overtime the, budget. There is, there, there's no, I, there's we no. We take out the holiday pay. We're still talking about over seventy thousand dollars in overtime that we need to cut, Zach. I can, I can cut that. I can eliminate that overtime, no problem. I need to hire twice as many people. So when somebody calls out or there's a late call, that there is another shift that is staggered that I can give them the call. And we can't give it to a per diem. If you got a per diem who's willing to come in on you know short notice, oh yeah, no. If I get like an emergency, so if I get a call out, right? So right now somebody says, "Hey, I just tested positive for COVID. I won't be in for my 7 a.m." Yeah. Like first thing that happens is it goes out to the per diems. We call the per diems. Um, we you know we have an idea about um, availability and who's around. Um, the next thing that we do is we try to now that we have more full time staff is to move people around. Certainly if we have a little bit more notice, um, that, that overlap that we have on the impact shift with the full-timers, that capacity, we can move. Um, and so we've seen a significant reduction in overtime just since January 1st because of things like, hey Eric, you're on a 16 on Thursday, do you mind coming in for the overnight on Wednesday? You know, like, oh yeah, absolutely, that works perfect for me, right? Or, hey, you're coming in at nine, I actually need you to come in at seven. Okay, no problem. Um, so we do that. Worst case, last case scenario is like the, hey, my 7 a.m.'s out, you're out at 7, can you, can you hold over until 9? Um, because I got a 9, I got a per diem coming in off of their other job, they'll be in here for 9. Um, so that's usually what happens. Um, and so that would be, you know, your two hours of overtime that week potentially, or that late, that call that you get at, 245 and there isn't another truck on and so you got to take it because that's your call um, and and that's how we play it you know like it sometimes somebody will come in ready for their shift a little bit earlier their truck will be squared away and they might take it um, and then they're only getting 15 minutes overtime but are, are we 
are most of the employees or staff, whatever whatever you want to call them, are they 40 hours a week? Yeah, all of all the full timers are 40. And they just get an hour lunch during or an hour meal during. Uh, n no, thanks to federal law, they don't get any sort of um, allotted required break because the idea is that they're they're intermittent enough that yeah, they yeah, will yeah. get a break. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. So they're all 40, so there's no way to cut that to 35, so you have that buffer of a two hour here, two hour there over time. Oh, so they paid, even if they are 40 hour a week, are they paid hourly, or are they paid, um, do they get a salary? Uh, I am the only salaried employee, everybody else. So they're punching the clock. Yep, yep, yep. And we round to 15 minutes, quarter hour. Mm -hmm. So, and so this, since I'm a new, new cog here, I'm gonna ask, um, do, how many calls a week do you go out on? Depends on the week. So, on average, I mean, how much of your time is spent on the truck? On an ambulance? It, and, and how much is it spent administratively? I Significantly more administrative. Um, I didn't do a call today, but I was in three, you know, Warsock Zoom meetings. And so that's that's primarily what my job is and why I'm salaried is because I'm, I'm a non-exempt employee because the majority of what I do is administration. But I'd say on average, one to two calls. Um, a week? De yeah, depending on our staffing or, or where that falls. Can you increase your time on the truck no. at all? No, definitely not. No. No, nothing will get done. At the least police just got an administrative assistant. Are we going to hire an administrative assistant to help oh. here? Actually, that's not a bad that idea. Could, that could free him up to spend more time on the truck. What would you prefer? <laughs> um, spend more administrative time or more truck time? Yeah, that's not going to save money. I know. I'm just yeah. asking. Uh, I'd rather administrative time because you go on a call and you can't. I mean, that's. I mean, even one hour and a half call screws you for three if you're trying to do something. Okay. I'm not buying um, this administrative time anyway. I called him today. He didn't answer. So I don't know what he was doing. Uh, so Carolyn was on the Zoom phone. meeting I was in. <laughs> I know, but I just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, I mean, this this is problematic because I think we're all going to be, have tight budgets. And so, there's. I mean, I, I look, I mean, we really can't cut anything, but. No. Why uh, is, why is that overtime a problem, aside from the fact that you're looking to cut money? Because, because the way. I mean, I see the, you know, the timesheets. It, it is not working out two hours here or two hours there or on the average. I mean, we're paying employees for big chunks of time. And yeah, but is town meeting going to really look look at that? Yes. Well, I, we're I, have I to. think Why? I think Carol, Carolyn does have a point, and 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 if I could, because we we over the last couple of years we were told that if we're going to add staff we would eliminate our overtime, and our overtime really hasn't been eliminated. So I, I guess, mean, that, I guess we'll, that's a, convers it's a conversation I, point to have. I think I, the numbers I pulled for overtime since we added the additional staff has gone down. Um, not, I guess, to the degree that you're hoping for. I will say this. So that it's is a, still projected to be across, over. Across 10 employees for a 24-7 department, that's 1,000 hours a year. If we knew exactly when those hours were going to happen, we could hire a 20 hour a week employee to cover exactly those hours. The other option is to increase our staffing levels so that we maintain our minimums if somebody is out sick or something happens. Um, right now, our staffing is two people, seven days a week, 24-7, that's our minimum staffing, plus the impact shift. But that means if one person calls out sick on A1, we don't have an ambulance. Um, on a larger department, like on a fire department, you would have six people on duty. Four of them would be on the ambulance. If one person called out sick, then you would still have four people to be on your ambulances and you wouldn't have to resort to overtime. So we can eliminate overtime, but it would require hiring more full-timers which would cost more than the amount of overtime. So, so as far as keeping one ambulance staffed, the overtime that we're occurring is cost effective compared to hiring more full-time staff. The other concern with overtime is burnout. So Northampton Fire, one of the employees had 700 hours of overtime last year. 700 hours of overtime last year. And that is because of their staffing models 
they just hold you over. You work a 24 and they need you at 7 a.m. They say, too bad, so sad, you're on for another 24. Um, that type of overtime is bad because even if you can afford it, you create burnout. So that person's now working on a 48 or they have no time off or they hate their job. And with the, the reason I keep talking about averages is because it's representative of the lack of concern I have for, for burnout. That if that one, if one person picks up an extra eight hours of overtime this week because of an emergency call out, it's in between their five days off. And so we're not asking them to stay on duty and holding them over or things like but that. But we're not working 24 hours, are we, Jack? We have some so, shifts that are 24 hours. Um, okay, I, didn't, I guess I didn't well, know Well, I that. guess, I, you I know, know, I, that's it's, another it, thing that I had noticed, and, and, and we're, I'm not really sure I'm comfortable with a 24-hour shift. So 24 hours are, there's, there's a threshold at which they become unsafe, and this is well documented, and we are well below that threshold, is because our call volume during the evenings drops to a level in which um, the, our providers are not staying up for the duration of that time, and also it's maximizing um, our ability to capture them for that time. When you go to shorter shifts, when you do like a 3 to 11, an 11P to 7A, um, what happens is those employees start either moonlighting or they try to bookend those shifts with um, other work, right? So, um, like our per diems that come in for 9 a.m., it's not unusual. I have one, I've, we had to make a, a policy adjustment specifically for her, which was she would come in off of a per diem shift at 7 a.m. She worked all night, she's up all night, they do eight hour shifts, and so she's awake and then she's coming in at nine and she's tired. And we're like, this doesn't work. You, like, you need to go home and rest. Um, so we have the luxury of being able to say, come in at 7, and you're here for a full 24. We know what your duty cycle is going to be. We know whether it's safe for you to be here. We have control over you. And at the end of that 24, because of the way our schedules go, you're not coming back for at least 72. And so they have that, that respite cycle And you know well. that they're not working somewhere else. Uh, we don't have... We don't have a moratorium on that. Like, there's no way that I can reach out and say, like, you're prohibited from working someplace else or anything like that. But for our full-time employees, and this is why full-time employees are great, is that they don't need to work someplace else. Um, and that when they're off of work, they get to go home and they're not trying to make ends meet the way the per diems are. And, and you also can't, you, you also can't, can't judge how somebody's using their off time because what happens if somebody puts in a 16-hour shift and they've got a two-month-old at home? They're up for those eight hours. Mm -hmm. So it, it's hard to say, well, yeah. you can't work and you can do other things. In my defense, she's six that months. <laughs> so, but... You were doing math over there. I was, because right in this, in 2024, the proposed budget is, the overtime is 11.5% of total salary, not including fringe. Okay. Okay. In 2023, it was down to 7.8, which was, which was good. But otherwise, 2022, 10.2, 2021, 10.1, 2020, 10%, 2019, 10.1%, 2018, 9.8%. So it's it's a bump. Forget the the, aber the aberration of the 7.8 last or the current fiscal year. You're, you've gone up 1.4%. Mm -hmm. So my question, which isn't a dramatic increase over the norm, but my question then would be, What's the average overtime percentage across other organizations? Because that'll answer, Carolyn, what, what's possible and what's not. Because if, if everyone's running those kinds of percentages, well, that means probably it's just the industry. If someone's at, if, 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 if there are a few that are at 5.5% or whatever the percentage is, mm -hmm. then it's an indicator of, oh, maybe we can figure out how to be creative. And if we find out that we're lower, then we're like, oh, we're pretty good. But I, I, I think that the trend line is important to learn, but again, we're only 1.4% over the norm other than that, I, the average. Like, yeah, I like, and I think some of I like, your, I like the premise of your, your statement, John. That makes a lot of sense. How does it compare to police and other, other, other services? Because right. these conversations are happening in the other yeah. services. Uh, yeah, my two thoughts on that, I like that. One would be, I'm wondering how much of that is the two additional full-timers and the holiday pays. I don't know. Um, the holiday pay hasn't changed, though, has it? 
No, no but now oh, I've got the th thirteenth holiday. Right. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing would too would be just making sure we find uh, comparable departments running similar staffing. So, Zoe, when, yeah. when somebody works a twenty-four hour shift, are they paid overtime? No. It's all straight time. Forty hours within a seven-day pay period. That's how. And again, I know that <laughs> I've been in a lot of different situations. I know what the state law says, but I know I've, I've introduced to. Uh, to Deerfield and Sunderland and Whiteley personnel, they're, they're different. Mm -hmm. So that it'd be 40 hours. So Every, everybody four, is scheduled for 40 hours in a seven day. It's all straight. Yeah, straight there's, time. there's no okay. such thing as like like regular overtime or mandatory overtime or expected overtime. Yeah, yeah. And you don't have any more part timers. I, we we constantly hire. We constantly bring them through. Um, the part timers because they have to work full time someplace else. We fill next month's schedule on the 15th of the previous schedule. So those part-timers fill those. So we'll, the, these overtime hours are your emergency call-outs, your sick things, things like okay. that. Okay, you know anecdotally better than I do because you know the people. But I can't help but challenge one of your statements. The part-timers have to work somewhere else. You're telling me that there are no part-timers who just want to work part-time because they've got kids at home. They've got, they, they, they just, it just does not exist. That's quite a blanket statement. I, on its surface, that's just like, oh. Yeah. No one, I, I mean, I know people who, who, who want to, we all have town employees that want to work 20 hours yeah. because I don't want to work 40 hours because my spouse works, you know, whatever it is. So I, I just wonder whether part of the solution not this year, is instead of one, and it may blow out your costs in another area, if you had two 20-hour part-timers that could take the hit on the overtime because they want to work part-time, not because they're already working 40 hours somewhere else. That's a possible solution, but again, that means you're going to hit your benefit package higher probably. Yeah, the, the part-timers that I know that are interested in working part-time are ones that are currently enrolled in college, like full-time school, they're going to nursing school, they're going to, so, so like, so, yep, yeah, so, so like. They can, they can take four hours here and there. So they have to be able to work, work around their schooling, um, yeah. and we have quite a few. Um, the, the thing is that because it's a career, the EMT basics that we employ, um, because you are, I'm not gonna say not supervised, because you're alone on a truck with one partner and you're covering a, a service area that's so large and you might not have fire or PD on scene, we have to hire EMT basics with at least a year of full-time experience. We've learned this through experience, that when we hire a basic with less experience than that, they struggle and we can't. We can't meet the demands of their, their training and orientation. Those EMTs that have at least a full year of experience are preparing for things like paramedic school. They are in paramedic school, they're making a career out of it. So they don't have a separate means of income. You know, they're not retired, they're not things like that. Yeah. Um, and um, those people step up. When we are filling shifts the month ahead, the, per, the, the impact shifts, no problem. They are there. We fill those shifts. They're happy to work, and, and they work consistently. Um, it is the, hey, I need somebody to come in in four hours for the next 16. That's where you struggle because they have a family at home or they have another job. But they should be like your that. first call still. They absolutely are. Yeah. Uh, all the time. Yeah. Um, all right. I, I'm just looking yeah. for trends. I'm yeah, of course. You know. um, it's, this is, and I mean, I mentioned this earlier, whereas, you know, if you looked at a, a fire department, and we see where police departments are going, you would just hire full-time staff. You know, if you were Amherst Fire, you wouldn't be trying to, you know, have part-time firefighters that just want to work part-time. You'd say, well, what do we need to cover our calls? What do we need to do that? Um, I know. It's just, I'm, yeah. I'm looking ahead that this is probably going to run into some trouble with um, all of our towns um because of our budget situation i would do the research on the other on the on the yeah other places just because then in town meeting carolyn or whoever or tim or or who's ever in town meeting floor can say this is what five other comparable departments are looking at in terms of their overtime and if they find that we're high that's not gonna be good for you 
in terms of in terms of her argument. In yeah. terms of, but if you if she finds that we're comp or if you find that we're comparable or yeah. even lower, then at least Carolyn or Tim or we'll have a better a, chance. A talking point. Yeah. I mean, because right now basically we're running two hundred two hundred out two hundred dollars of overtime a day, three hundred sixty five days a year. That's what seventy one thousand oh, works out to. We're taking the holiday pay stuff. Yeah, I, I, mean, I subtracted the holiday yes. pay. Yeah. That screws it up. Is so, that? I, unless I did my math wrong. I mean, I, I took seventy-one thousand, which is what we're talking about, right? Right. Uh, Divided by three sixty-five. Right. I, I mean, yeah. yeah. So then let's hire yeah, more I'm, full-timers, and that way we'd never have to. No, I'm, I'm just uh, call I'm anybody not, in or I'm not anybody not, over. I'm just analyzing numbers. I'm not saying this is good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah, I agree with Jonathan that that what needs to happen is a little reason. Yeah. Because so if you figure. Fifty dollars an hour. That's four hours but of our, time but our a day. Last, uh, four but hours our day. argument last year was that if we hired two part full timers, mm -hmm. right. that we would reduce our reduce overtime costs. The overtime costs. So therefore, yeah, we could vote. justify. Someone, someone's going to remember that. Yeah, yeah. someone. Well, yeah. someone voted no. So the fact <laughs> that we had the it's Diane, right? So I know. Yeah. Um, you had her here, and we saw what the cost increase would be if we brought a fourth town in. It would be interesting to know if we brought a, a fifth town in, what would that do? Because obviously there's like a cost benefit analysis. When you have two full, full, full time yeah. trucks, mm -hmm. what's the optimum you need in order to, to help, right. help everybody's budget? We're, we're in that space where... Right. And I'm just saying yeah. that we're not forward looking, we should ask Zoe to yeah. come up with, this would be the optimal thing where we, we have two full time trucks. I would, I would like to look at instead of because attrition happens yeah when a 40 hour a week full-time person leaves what happens if we post for 20 hours to 20 hours just to see what we get mm -hmm. in the pool and you might get junk you might get pleasantly surprised and you don't know until you try it to test well depends on what what shifts you're telling they're working on. of course i get i get all that but they're but that may not line up with what. what well, you know, means. maybe you do. You know, you you say, look, two of these shifts are going to be, you know, in a prime time, and four of them is going to be floating hours. We're going to call you for that because somebody calls in sick and they need you to come in for four hours. I mean, mm -hmm. administratively, it's a pain in the ass. I. At <laughs> what point do we start paying benefits? Twenty hours. Twenty hours. That was my question about yeah. the benefits. So you're going to pay double benefits. Yeah. Assuming someone takes them, and you can't, you can't take the rest that they're not going to take. Yeah. You have to allow. It's tough. Everybody's scrambling because, I mean, we're talking, our first budget meeting with the Finance Committee, 500000 out of whack. Yeah. That's it? That's it. Oh, that's an easy. Yeah, we will just tap Sunderland's budget. Oh, <laughs> you already do. <laughs> so hey, you already do, my friend. <laughs> and I'm not worried about it either. We'll solve it, but it's just, you know. I mean, we sold the increase last year for the two additional staff persons. Did you get a bunch, did you get big push, pushback? You did. Yeah. I mean, not necessarily town meeting. meeting. How I feel about your town meeting? You go to two granular in your town meeting. Mm -hmm. It didn't come but up in town meeting. It was no, it was, it was in the finance, finance committee. And, finance. Uh, it's going to come up in finance. Yeah. yeah. Jonathan, yeah. I think anytime you hire, when you put additional staff, I mean, the our, the school wants to add a, a a person this year, right? And it's a conversation because we, it's adding a person. And, well, and, you're adding and, retirement. You're adding right, you're, uh, well, right. Look, which yeah. we're underfunded. From and 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 my thing w w when you add a person, we all know that the cost of living, your cost of living, cola is not the only increase in a person's salary. Mm -hmm. right. right. And and so so if you if if you have a two per, if you have a two percent cola or two and a half percent cola, you still going to probably have three percent. So you, if that puts your budget. Labor seventy percent of the budget. What was coal this year? So, huh? What was coal this we year? Have, we have both. It's going to be six seven percent. I budgeted three based on yeah. your well, field personnel committee. Eight percent. Yeah, but we do a yeah, step. Yeah, but they get a step as well. A step and a three percent. They do step. I don't, I don't buy this step stuff. You pay okay. merit. I agree. I agree, but the, we haven't been successful in implementing it. You have to do reviews. I understand all this. I, I was I was there. No, no. Was. Oh yeah, was. In capital letters. Was. Well. 
All right. So, so where are we at? Are we? Yeah. Well, we've gotten to overtime. <laughs> what else on this bus do we need to talk about? I, I don't think there, were, there really isn't much you can talk about because it's you know. I, those are the only things that changed from the last budget yeah. was the um, medical insurance and uh, retirement numbers. Uh, the indirect costs went down and the workman's comp went down from the previous draft budget. It, billing went, I mean, uh, yeah, billing went up. Billing goes up because it's a percentage of what we collect. Yeah, three point nine percent of collections or whatever. Um, so if billings up. If runs are up, billings are up. Utilities yeah. are up, way up. Yeah, uh, electric went up because we had been on. What is it when you're like building something and you get like a flat rate while you're building, and then they're supposed to swap swap it over to an actual service or something? Oh, you want an estimated. You're an estimated, not uh, actual. Yeah, so they finally got wise, and, yeah. and that's um, estimated. Pro propane doubled. Are you part of um, the uh, ag aggregation electrical? We so you're been, getting yeah, it uh, we through the town. Those, right? those are great savings, right? Because we're, 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 we're yeah, we're not. Greatly's not increasing its electrical. Huh? No, we aren't either. Yeah, no. we will soon. Next year. Yeah. Well, well it, it's December. funny because we had a store in Sunville that also have a, a place in Hatfield. And they have they have an aggregate also, but just Hatfield residents, I guess, and they're electrical. Why we're with about eleven right. or something yeah. communities, and and he calls. Well, what do I do? Because my because he wasn't on our aggregate. He joined our aggregate. And he said, I wish we could do this in Hatfield. I said, Well, call Hatfield because I'm I think they're an aggregate person also. Hmm. They did not have the same savings we did. So no, we got locked in. We were nice we were very we were very good in our, our aggregates were yeah. excellent. Hey hey Zoe, are your medical service fees estimate are, are they pretty accurate? Medical service oh that's um uh that is that is inching closer and closer to what I think we will actually be getting. Are you are you gonna be above or below? I think based on my estimations we're gonna come in at like six hundred and seventy. Okay, so you're being conservative. Okay. I am, but we're cutting away at the uh, money that we would normally put aside <coughs> for capital assistance. Um, we had a meeting with Scott Soares, who's the head of USDA Rural Development on um, this past week. And um, there's no money this year, but next year we're going to get in a cycle so we can try to get an ambulance. Our new ambulance? They have a community facilities grant from rural USDA. Yeah. Lori has already been in contact with USDA, <coughs> um, and I know I looked into this a number of years ago for an ambulance replacement, so we have some historical yeah, stuff good, there. So ultimately, you have to get you have practically to get, have to get your application in the line the, the year before it's the funding. So that's yes. why we're going to get your like application that. right now for next year. Right. Who's writing that? We'll uh, Lori, one of our recent full-time hires, is a real cracker jack. She's okay. she's taken on grant writing. So we've got two hundred eighty-five in the bank. Is that how I'm reading that? Oh no, that's revenue. How much do we have in the bank right now? We took out one hundred and fifty potentially. Well, it's not taking it out. We out, we voted to buy those car, cardi uh, cardiac monitors. Yeah. Because it's eighteen months out. And they're at eight years in the yeah, way. That's fine. Yeah. So what do we got in the bank? Right Three hundred and ninety-two thousand and fifty-four dollars. After the one fifty or before. After. So two eighty-four five five four going towards offset. Yeah. And then uh, seventy-five hundred for the IV pumps, and then a hundred thousand towards the ambulance replacement, and that's the separate capital budget. I just think it's amazing when people set rates because there's a very interesting article about what um, municipalities charge and how some states govern their their cost. Like in Connecticut, you can charge seven hundred and sixty-one dollars for an ambulance ride, and I said that that's if you go to an accident. But somebody was telling me maybe it was Crystal when when she, they got mom was transferred from Cooley to Bay State it was like five thousand dollars. They, don't, they, they make don't, money on transports. They, the mm -hmm. emergency is really is a, is break even or or lose money even. Mm -hmm. Why don't no, you we lose money. get money on transport? Because we don't transport. Why can't we? Because we don't have an ambulance that and staff to do that. 
Right. If we're talking about non-emergent medical transports, in order to do that, you have to negotiate and become in network with the insurance companies. And when you negotiate and become in network, part of that negotiation is instead of paying you the $1,800 for your 911 call, they'll only pay you $500. But in your calculations, you make up for it because you go, oh, well, I'm just going to do medical discharges all day long and and dialysis runs and so that way we're actually not doing 911 calls we're only doing these medical needs um, and so that's, that's how you make that by us not doing discharges we don't have any facilities in town we don't have any sort of medical anything so by us staying out of network we can charge the full rate to everybody and then the health insurance company says okay. I just thought I'd ask okay. well you, so you, you didn't have an option when you called 911 you, you couldn't shop around so we'll pay whatever they're asking um, okay the other network it's a, it's a mm -hmm. trying to diversify revenue stream mm -hmm. yeah and that's the only other thing that we can do is like how do you improve the revenue stream is it possible to um, you know I'm ignorant of a lot of this stuff I'd, I'd actually like to meet with our collection guy and, and, and talk to him about how does this work explain this to me you go through regular you, you get what you get then it goes to the collections and then you make a determination and then what happens after that and then when does it go into non-collectible so for instance um, you know no. I have a four thousand dollar deductible is are they going to charge me for an ambulance run the difference between what what the insurance does and then you know what, what I you're do. describing is balanced billing and yeah. what happens is if you have insurance we bill your insurance for our standard rate your insurance pays whatever they think right they should and if there is a balance your your insurance says Tim will pay the rest and then so you get a bill for that difference right um, and Sometimes, then it's on you. You could appeal it, and then your insurance company right. pays that, or they don't. Or right. Whatever. Or, yeah, um, what I'm trying to figure out is I just like to be assured that, you know, there's not, a, there's not an instance where there's a person who's able to pay that we're treating like somebody who's not able to pay. And the only, you know, we, we sit around here and talk about how we have this agreement, and I, I don't disagree with what your philosophy is. But I just want to make sure what is our what is our company doing for us? Because the you know the auditor has questions, Brenda has questions. We talk to you. We seem to understand it, but the gap between what we're bringing in and what we're paying out is going to keep continue increasing, and we need to explore all the options. Yes, yeah. um, that's segueing into the next thing. I will say, uh, Jonathan brought up the question about what we have in retained earnings. So we have basically $100,000 sitting in retained earnings that we're applying towards the ambulance, which if the operation operating budget is untenable, we could decide that, okay, we're actually gonna take that money away from the ambulance replacement and put it towards us to get the assessments down. Um, but... Um, I don't, I don't wanna do that. Okay. I would prefer not to do it. Because yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Then you're gonna have to battle the capital right. expense yep. down exactly. the road. Yeah, and that's yep. that's okay. hard enough. So, that I just I just wanted to at least say that out loud. So yep. okay, I'm not, I'm not interested in changing how we're. You know, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get some way to get an ambulance without paying the three hundred seventy-five thousand or four hundred thousand. Yeah. Oh, we are but working on it. I don't want to change the fact that we're still putting money away for an ambulance mm -hmm. because I you know we made a decision that this is an operational expense. Yep. And we need to keep doing that. And then, right. yeah, no, this, we need to plan. We so, don't. So, I agree. So the problem is, it's really hard if, to sell. If we plan. could, Jack, yeah. next, at our next something meeting, something that, mm -hmm. that the town government doesn't do very well. Doesn't plan maintenance. It doesn't plan a lot. A lot of, of things we don't plan. Right. Yeah. If, so. if you could, put for, on our next meeting, put on the agenda item a discussion about um, um, the billing, because because we we talk about this every couple of years. I think Tim. Tim has a good has a good point. Just review, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance. Yeah. But put that on the agenda so that you can have a little information of what we have. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, ultimately, you know, unless we're doing our own billing, or we're not doing our own billing, are we? No. no. So, I would like to have the company that does the billing 
come to us every couple of years and explain this to us. But that's a good question on how we are doing our write-offs because, yeah. I mean, if you have a $4,000 deductible and you need to ride in the ambulance, I'm assuming that your insurance company is not going to pay for that and that we would... Yeah, these it. are things I don't know. So yeah. here's well, but, but we also agreed that Medicare and Medicaid patients, because the government's going to reimburse what they're going to reimburse. Yeah, absolutely. That we were not going to go chasing those people just because of the... Absolutely. Right. No, so yeah. whatever yeah. we get from Medicare and Medicaid, that's, that's it. No, yeah. right. You are, you are, it is a legal to balance bill, a Medicare and Medicaid patient. Right. So those patients do not show up on this disposition report. Those are ones that are automatically included in like the expect to not collect or whatever. So yeah. what happens is when we, when we do a medical run, their insurance information gets recorded into our medical record. Yeah. Comstar, once a week, reaches in and pulls out that information. And so our, it's called timely receipts or whatever, all happens uh, within seven day time frame, which is really good. And then they push it out immediately to the insurance company if they have the information. They also reach out to, uh, they have a relationship with Cooley Dickinson Hospital and Bay State Health. So if they can check on updated health insurance information. So when you, even if you go in the ambulance, registration of the hospital um, gets uh, updated. And then what happens is they bill out and if there is a balance on the bill, they then send the bill to the patient. And so the patient receives bills from Comstar, right. says, you know, on behalf of the town of Deerfield doing business as South County EMS, you owe us $250. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then I understand all that, Zoe. What I'm saying is, I'd like to meet the people who okay, work right. for us. That's a good idea. And let them I'm talk to us and let us ask questions because I agree that what, we shouldn't have this conversation repeatedly because I people think, don't believe the answers we're getting. I think and I'm I think going we to should include the accountant in this discussion so that she can learn. I think I'm going to throw Carolyn under the bus. I think that the purpose of the fiduci or the fiscal agent representative. In, in like the idea would be that the town accountant would be sitting here and we're obviously not going to ask Brenda to do that but that these questions right these timely receipts these write-offs we'd have somebody in the room that would be like this is this is what the latest report is this is what I'm seeing um, things like that when the write-offs finally do happen I've never been part of a conversation in this group that writes off the things is that something that just the town of Deerfield does what happens is um we, Zoe comes and presents us with accounts that are that we need to write off on, and so we you do show it at the select board meeting. Right. Okay. Because it would be you guys. It wouldn't be us. Because it's the fiduciary. Yeah. Right. 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 But we there are actually. Those were things but this, took but take an hour. Yeah. This year is is more problematic because we we haven't gotten our management letter yet, but we have not had probably. For the majority of my time, I cannot even remember we've ever had anything from our auditor. But our auditor is, is very concerned about the write-offs and, and the numbers that we're carrying on the books. So we don't have the management letter yet, so I don't know exactly what the issue is yet, per se, but they're very, so he's, he's very concerned. So the clarification from the auditor, as I understand it, is that what we are doing, how we are handling this, is not unusual. So that there are, so I just want to preface that many communities handle it this way, the way we, we are doing it. At five years, they just write it off and they carry this balance. But the auditor said, a better way to do it is take care of this stuff before it's getting out to five yeah, I years. I think Waitley, again, we haven't done it for years. Probably, no. But you wouldn't. You wouldn't need to now. But no, yeah. but be before oh, we yeah. existed. It was within a year or two. They were gone. So they were written off. I spoke with the auditor. Oh, good. I oh. had a conversation during and from his notes, the auditor's notes. During our audit, we noted there's a significant amount of age ambulance accounts receivable as of June 30th, 2022. There's approximately 1.168 million of ambul of ambulance accounts receivables outstanding and of that accounts that exceed 120 days old is 981,409, about 83%. We obtained a copy of the request for disposition report, which was 149 pages of delinquent accounts with various type of errors, totaling $879,231 and dating back to May 18, 2015. 
The report from the third-party billing company Comstar is sent monthly and notifies the town they need to take corrective action on these accounts before further collection attempts can be made. We recommend the town review the request for disposition report and make corrections to the accounts that can be fixed. Send the accounts to collection agency that Comstar works with where appropriate and write off uncollectible amounts. Furthermore, the town should implement procedures to review this report monthly and ensure all monies are collected timely. When we first started working with Comstar, Mary Stokarski was our treasurer at the time, and in speaking with Mary, it was it would go through Comstar, Comstar would send out their multiple letters. When Comstar got to a point where they couldn't collect anymore, that list would typically come to Mary. Mary would take a look at that list. Based on her knowledge of the people in town, she would make the decisions or recommendations to either write it off or attach liens against property, whatever it might be. It might be somebody passed away and there's an estate and there's money in the estate and they wanted to get the money out of the estate. Very messy. It is messy. But the money sat around until we figured out what do we want to do. We could take every opportunity to collect that. What Tom is essentially recommending is as you go through those reports, sometimes there are errors in the report that the address that we received from the patient at time of service is no longer accurate. Transient, somebody moved, they left, whatever the case is. He said, if you can fix those, then they can rebuild. I said, great, as long as we can get an updated address from whoever that is. Beyond that, we need to tighten up our policy to say, if they've billed and your insurance is paid, the balance on the insurance, if the person has received two letters and doesn't pay, we need to send them to collections. We don't have to take grandma out of her house to collect it, if that's what we decide to do, but we should tighten up what our policy is to get them into collections sooner, because the sooner you get them into collections, the better chance you'll have of receiving that money. If we continue to let it go for longer periods of time, bigger issues. Okay. And to so that's really what I want to explore is, you know, right. Right. are we doing it the right way? I mean, well, maybe let's get Comcast in here and then. Yeah. Um, I think, so, I, a couple things that stood out to me there, this number that was quoted as this million, million something. Million 168. So I've got the disposition report. There are a bunch of line items here that are listed archive data. And those are amounts that have been written off. We don't carry anything going back that far. So I don't. I want to make sure with Comstar that whatever the accountant thinks they're seeing right. is an accurate representation because yeah. um, this is only showing three hundred forty-two thousand of over one hundred and twenty days. Okay. So so we need to make sure. So that I thought we, yeah. I thought we had written. Off. We have. And you yeah. might have. He said as of June thirtieth, twenty twenty-two. So, no, I, I, it seems oh, like we, yeah, well, whenever that letter was, August or whatever, you know, so. Okay. Um, August but, 11th, 2022. Yeah. Um, but, would, yeah. My suggestion, get your data together and go see the auditor. He's willing to have a conversation and let him know, here's what we've done to date, and then we can let him know. I, I'm happy to do whatever we need to do. Mm -hmm. I just want to know what that is. Exactly, yeah. and I, that's why I keep saying, you know, I'd like to get the people that are involved in this in the same room, mm -hmm. because, you know, when you hear a conversation from one party and the other party's not there, there's no back and forth, and you okay. can't figure out, okay, this is just a reporting problem. It, it could potentially yeah. just be a reporting problem, and the auditor is worried about nothing, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we need to clarify what the story is, and if there is a problem, fix it. If there isn't a problem, you know, and I agree that maybe some of the people that are being just automatically, oh, we're not going to collect from this person. Maybe we should. Um, you know, I don't. I don't have any noticeable income except my five thousand dollars slap in the face from the town of Deerfield for my forty-five hours a week. But um, I can pay my bill that's you in excess. Part, you only work part time now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Tim, I thought. Tim, I thought was is that all the, on the agenda? Is that what? What? Can, can but I, you know what I mean. What, 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 do, do, is there more? I guess I guess I follow, if I could, I'd like to follow. So does the town 
it was interesting, but when you talk about, there's an $800,000 difference between what um, Zoe's saying and what you guys have, and, and I guess, what what is the internal Deerfield policy for the write-ups? How does that, you know what I'm trying to I, say, Zoe? I had thought that we have been writing them off. I, I have too. I, I'm, yeah. I'm I, serious. I thought since I'm the new guy, I get to because we did, you guys would have experienced that right off. You can't think you've written off if you haven't well, had meetings in two I years. Then no, who? no, everything no. older than five years old. We has voted. Been we voted off. With, while I've been on yes. this thing to, yes. to to get rid of some. And you have sizable this. number. Yes. Yes. Two hundred thousand or something on a regular basis, okay. John. But okay. but we did. No, it just sounded. It sounded like you don't. You didn't remember having the meeting. So. That means it would not happen, but okay. No, nothing older than like three or 2017 or 18 is on the books. Everything older than that has been written. Well, let's hope so. Yeah, but, but that no, is but, uh, that is to the, the accountant's point, we have or done the auditor's point. Right. Right. There's, right. Right. there's right. a lot of things like that are once a year pretty so, old. At least. You know, so and, and we 2017, it's 2023. That's five but years. I didn't have so, the draft, so, so, so I wasn't who, who aware write, of who, who is responsible for the final write-off? Town of Deerfield. Well, I know, but does the board? board the, but is board. it the board? The select board does. Select see, board votes see, on. we we had that when in in our town. I don't know about Whiteley, but in our town, we did not want we didn't want to know people' monetary business. So that was up to the that was up well, to our. We team. don't. We just. Well, we're presenting we redacted the, the names. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We just it's presented just, the numbers. This is what they're presenting. These are uncollected. Right. It doesn't. I didn't want to know names. Yes, there is no details yeah. presented in public. You know, once in a while there'd be a. Trust me, you know these people, and they can't pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no, they redacted the names, and not because I don't want it. Because I'm with you, Tom. I don't want to know the financial situations no, of people. Exactly. It's not. It's awkward. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. It, but it, 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 it is it's our a, responsibility it's just to write the total up. Total amount. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I, I see that this is a constant thing that comes up, and so all I'm suggesting is trying to short circuit it so that we can yeah. not. I was just going to say, Tim is right. Since you've been on the board, we voted it. Yeah. Right? No, we have. We've done that once. August so. 11th, yeah. 2022. Yeah. Writing off a total of one hundred twenty thousand nine hundred forty-two dollars and twenty-one cents for seventy-nine bills greater than six years old. Yeah. And that was going back May to May eighteenth, twenty fifteen. Right. Great, greater than six years old. Yeah. And I think the oh. auditor so you didn't do it. We should write it off sooner than that. that day. Yes. Yeah. No, we so didn't we either write take it write it off sooner or send it to on collection that. sooner. Right. Right in, oh. on, on, in August, you did not write in off anything of any recent. Um, so no. no, no, we we right. do it in the like five year. I don't know. And then, then that's a, a policy, you, you know, like if we can I, shorten it up. I had set a goal to go quarterly, but months. like yeah, life gets in the way. Yeah. So um, if we're going to meet with Comstar, you're yeah, going to put it on the next agenda. May I, right. may I recommend a meeting in a space? Are we going to ask them to come here? Or Zoom or, we or something? Zoom. Or, we're zoom. If we're going to Zoom, are we going to Zoom it here? Are we going to go over to Town Hall and no, we should Zoom on the big zoom screen? No, on, on the big screen so Brenda can be there. Because it's important that Brenda be if in the room. Zoom, make sure Brenda's there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is it possible to do this during working hours, or are we going to ask Brenda to stay late? I, I There's no way I can. You can't do it during... It, it would be... No, I understand. I was I was just asking. It would be... I mean, I can, Yeah. No, but... No, it's fine. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm not asking it to, to be required. To the with yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, the oh, or Brendan, so well, I, 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 I personally think that that's a, a Deerfield thing. I, I think we voted what what we wanted to do as a board. And I think that we all agree there's consensus of what we want to do as a board. So if yeah. if we set this up with Comstar, Tim, myself. And, and then, the then, then, and then put it on the next. Then put the it on our and, agenda and, so you can and, report. And, and, yeah, and have a report back to the. But I think it's important to have Brenda involved. Yes. So that she oh, no, understands. No, no, you, you, know, you should have yeah. any any financial, you, oh, oh, or if you want, if you want our town administrators, or the other town administrators to be there, that's fine also. Or we may want to decide that look, we're in the middle of budget season, and we don't necessarily want to add this burden to Brenda right now, but we want to in the next three months because this is not an urgent. I mean, no, this six is, year old bills think, is not, you know, right. going to solve our. Based yeah. on what Comstar says, we may need to amend what amend our policy. Our policies. It, it, yeah. th this is my point: is that it sounds like the will of this board is in conflict with what the policy right. is, and so all we need to do, 
Let's fix the policy. Make a policy that you're happy with, and I can just churn through things. Right. So. I, I would prefer, and you guys won't be surprised to hear this, I would prefer that we make our policy here and the town of Deerfield abides by our policy. That's well, that's what they're currently doing. Yeah, we need are. to update what well, our that's policy fine. is. Oh, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. And yeah. As, long as, as long as part of that conversation is we want to solve the auditor issue, if there is really an issue, and his issue seems to be, let's write this stuff off but, sooner than we have But this is the, the time frame, but, but Tim, everybody's correct. We want Brenda involved, but this is like, the, she's maxed out right now. And that's fine. And, the, and all I want to do is have some response so that for the, when we get audited next year, this, whatever is right. solved. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and I also want to avoid finance committees thinking that we are fiscally irresponsible because right. we're writing stuff but that, and that, yeah, exactly. And that is exactly right. Because they'll I make decisions make sure. based on a total lack of right. 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 And I think if we can shorten the window of, of having bad debt, then it's not going to be as large and it's not, you know, and then we'll also have And I our, think a in good general people understand that the, that the, you know, you only, you can charge five, Fifteen hundred dollars for an ambulance so ride, that, that but if it's Medicare, then you're only going to get seven hundred or whatever. Well, whatever, it so it is, whatever it is, whatever it is, there is yeah. a difference. Well, yeah. also, you know, but that's true. Private insurance it should, it's not that low. Yeah, but they're only going to pay Blue Cross is only going to pay eighty-five percent. Yeah, and you know what? If it was me and Blue Cross only paid eighty-five yeah. percent, you know, there's a huge difference. Twenty-eight. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. something going on. Yeah. But if they say no, I'm only covering X for this ambulance ride, I'm not paying anymore. Yeah. No, so but, I don't, a, yeah, but Comcast is supposed yeah. to only so I, I don't, I, If it's I don't beyond your deductible, you know, then you make a different calculation. Like, right. Once I reach 4000 right. am I going to pay? I, I'm that? not going. I don't know. No, so. We just have to figure out. We've got to figure out the audit. But I think okay. Zoe's correct that, that we want to, you know, examine if the policy is still the policy we want. Right. Here's my suggestion, if I may. Set up the meeting with Comstar. If you don't want to do it till after town meeting, I don't care. Yeah. Whenever you decide yeah. to do it, I, I just think it would be better probably in May or June. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. And that looks responsive ask, to the auditor. Sure. Because we haven't even gotten his letter. We can form. certainly ask Comstar. Mm -hmm. Do you have examples of write-off policies that you might be willing to share with us? Ask the auditor. Do you have an example of a write-off policy for municipal that service. you think would make sense for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's what our current policy says. Or after we go through and update it. Yeah. Take a look at this. Is this now going to meet what you're looking for? And then, you know, you get it all cleaned up. But mm. as long as there's a plan in place, I think we're good. I mean, yeah. I, nothing's going to change. And remember, when we set this policy, we were doing handwritten reports yep. that I once know. a week got mailed to Comstar. They had to be entered. They had to be manipulated. That was really true. So things have changed. It's become digital. So it's it's quicker. It's cleaner. The fact that Comstar interacts with the hospital to update the insurance information is great. Yeah. But unfortunately, you're still going to have that group of people yeah. that you're going to bill them. They're going to move, or maybe they've given you bad information because they don't want you to ever catch up and bill them. And Ooh. yeah, that's it, Mr. Acting Chair. Okay, what do you got next? May, that's it. That's it. May I make a motion to adjourn? Sure. Anybody going to second it though? No, I'm hoping. Do we have to set a date, or is it our regular? Uh, the next regular we meeting. We finally have a little meeting. He's looking to bail out already. Um, <laughs> this is why I got out of this. Game. Doesn't he have to buy us drinks or something? No. Let me just see. Next time. Probably, next time. Next time. Next time. Yeah, we'll see him in like a year from now. Uh, yeah, the next, next scheduled meeting is go March twenty first. It's good quality. Time. Good. It's in my kit. I'm gonna, What happened was it Skims was in at six thirty, and I got a. Mm. I'm going to edit this now, so I don't... Mm. I'm ready. Um, so March 21st is our next meeting? Mm -hmm. When do you go to the finance committee, our finance committee? Is that... Do you, I mean, so March really 20th. Oh, my God. Uh, March 20th. <laughs> yep. Oh. Yep. Deerfield is March 20th. Waitley is April 4th. And Sunderland already happened on in January. And they were happy? Because our time meeting doesn't happen until June. Uh, they were pretty yeah, We're trying to change ours to, sure. to move it back. To move it, to move it, yeah. So we Later know what the budget is. Yeah. So my plan was a long time ago. Already? I said, in so January? yeah, in the event that there's a but you don't have any vote, school numbers yeah. yet. No, or so there's a there's a yeah. for him. Oh, for him. We yeah. haven't yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. did we vote? Did yeah, we no adjourn? There's why motion. Why you all the way to adjourn? Please signify by saying on. I'll second the motion. All in favor. All in favor. Aye. Aye. For are you voting this time? I was here. 
Okay. We didn't notice. Meeting to adjourn. Thank you very much.